This story happened just this summer. I'm only now getting around to writing it down as well. So, I would consider myself an outdoorsman. I grew up in the sticks and I've spent a lot of time wandering in and enjoying the backcountry. I'm older now and have settled down in the suburbs. Wife, two boys, a house, a dog, a desk job, the whole suburban shtick. I want opportunities for my kids that come from suburban life, but I also want them to grow up with an appreciation for the outdoors. So when my oldest son was big enough for his first solo father-son camping trip, I was really excited. My wife and younger son stayed home for this midsummer trip and it was going to be a great bonding experience for me and my son. Because my son is just five, I didn't want to do anything too extreme on our first big solo camping trip. We needed a place that wasn't too deep in the Colorado Front Range, but still allowed for dispersed camping. I don't consider camping in RV parks or established campgrounds to be actual camping. I mean, you might as well just be in a motel watching TV. Camping, at most, is a tent, sleeping bag, and a fire for sure. A dispersed camping area called Gordon Gulch, west of Boulder, caught my attention because of this. I had never been to this area before. There were no facilities and it was dispersed enough that you couldn't see or hear other campers nearby. My son and I had a blast that day. We set up camp, collected firewood, went for a hike, saw a moose and a bobcat, tried a little fishing as well. And finally, as the sunlight faded, we returned to our campsite to light a fire. We had a very traditional and nutritious camping meal of fire-burnt hot dogs and marshmallows. It was a good day, really, and definitely a core memory for both my son and me. The perfect first camping experience for a preschooler, really. Or so I thought. So, after all that fun, my son and I were pretty exhausted. It was time for bed and the sound of an evening summer breeze through the pines is better than any commercial sleep aid. I don't even remember drifting off. It was a, a hard, dreamless sleep that only physical exertion can really bring on. One thing about my son is that he inherited many things from me. Hair color, eye shape, disposition, and my usual wide feet, but one peculiar thing he got from his mother was sleep talking. It's not unusual to hear him having full conversations in his sleep. It gets more pronounced when he's overly tired. But I was catapulted out of the void of sleep. Not sure what aroused me, but I sat up collecting myself. The world seemed to be at peace. It was quiet. Just me and the breeze through the treetops. I couldn't figure out what actually woke me so suddenly like that. But the sound of my son laughing in his sleep cut through my groggy confusion. It was a deep belly laugh. Must be a fun dream, I thought hazily. I gently rocked him, and that was enough to quiet him down. That must have been what startled me, I determined. As I sort of repositioned to fall back to sleep, my son burst out laughing. I sighed and closed my eyes. He'll quieten down soon enough, I thought. He laughed again, but this time, his laugh was echoed by something outside of our tent. I held my breath and listened, unsure of what I just heard. It wasn't an echo, though. There was something out there, and it was laughing in unison with my son. My grogginess vanished as the adrenaline began to pump. It couldn't be real. It had to be my imagination, surely. I sat up in my sleeping bag listening to the night. Hearing nothing after a minute, my muscles relaxed. I started to settle back down. I, I must have been hearing things. I mean, I was tired after all. Checking the time, I saw that it was four in the morning. The sun would be up in a couple of hours. My son laughed again. And again, it was answered with laughter outside. I was now absolutely certain that that was not an echo. As I tried to make sense of what was happening, the voice outside called my son's name. And at that, my blood ran cold. That voice, it was so familiar. Then it clicked in my brain. It was the voice of my younger son. 
That wasn't at all possible, though. He was safe at home with my wife, miles and miles away. I could hear twigs crunching beyond our thin nylon tent walls. It was impossible to tell the distance from us, but there was something out there circling us. Unprompted this time, it called out my son's name in that little toddler voice. My five-year-old, still fast asleep, called out to his brother, asking him to play. The thing outside the tent laughed in reply and urged my son to come outside. That thing with my little son's voice sounded cold though, sort of hollow, dead. The floodgates of my adrenaline burst open at this. Cold sweat formed on my face. I was frightened out of my mind, but my primal caveman brain roared to life all of a sudden. I was in papa bear mode and nothing was going to take or hurt my son. I was putting a stop to this and whatever it was that was out there, I didn't care. You don't mess with my kids. Say what you will as well, but when you're camping miles from anything, it's not worth the risk of being unarmed. Wild animals, wild people, you have to be prepared. I almost always take a firearm with me when I'm camping. Pepper spray and bear bells are great, but nothing gets attention from a conscious threat faster than the sound of chambering around. I spoke loudly into the night that I had a gun and was coming out. I hoped that the fear in my voice was masked by my aggressiveness. The only reply was the breeze through the treetops. My son was still asleep, thankfully. Kids are hard sleeper, another trait from his mum. My wife and I joked that he could sleep through a tornado, in fact. Stepping out into the cool summer night, though, a gun in one hand and a flashlight in the other, I surveyed the campsite. The fire was now down to embers. Our fishing gear was leaning against the pickup. The firewood was still neatly stacked, and really, nothing seemed out of place. Not wanting to stray far from the tent or my sleeping son, I sat down inside the entrance. I waited in the dark with the flashlight off, and it was then that, not far into the trees, I heard a branch break. Then another snapped, and this time it was closer. I stood up and flashed my light in the direction of the sound, but nothing was there. The voice then called out, this time from behind, and this time seemingly focused towards me. Daddy, Daddy, it said. It was my youngest son's voice again, crying out for me from the dark forest. I threw the light beam in that direction. A pair of shimmering green eyes were illuminated by my flashlight all of a sudden. They were only two or so feet above the ground, though, the same height as a toddler. I took a small step forward. I wanted to see more. I needed to see more. The eyes, unblinking, remained in place. Getting closer, though, didn't seem to help reveal this thing. In fact, it was weird. It seemed to absorb the light from my flashlight, almost devouring it. I couldn't make out its size, shape, or color. It seemed to swallow up the light all around it, save for its two shimmering green eyes, obviously. But that thing, whatever it was, laughed in its hollow toddler's voice, this time with malice and cruelty in it. The eyes never looked away from me, never blinking, focused only on me, almost like a predator before the pounce. Not wanting to give up any ground to a predator, I stepped forward again. It didn't move. Not knowing what to do, I screamed as loud as I could. I waved my arms, trying futilely to shoo it away. The eyes shimmered, and as I stared back, the eyes shifted from green to amber. I watched as they began to rise up into the air, and it was now apparent to me that this thing... Whatever it was, had been crouching and was now standing up. I could only watch in silent terror as the eyes finally stopped rising, nearly ten feet off the ground at this point. The night air erupted with a deep growl. I could feel the vibrations in my guts. I couldn't see a mouth, but I could hear teeth sort of snapping and gnashing. My son in the tent behind me began to scream at this point. That was the only time the eyes lost focus on me, and shifted towards the screams of my kid. 
My only reaction was to fire my gun into the air. The eyes immediately vanished. My ears were ringing, but I could hear the growls turn to shrieks, followed by a cacophony of crashing branches and undergrowth. I stood there until I couldn't hear the shrieking anymore. It trailed off deep into the trees. I was left with only the sound of the breeze in the treetops and the quiet sobbing of my kid. Twilight was beginning to illuminate the forest. Shaking and somewhat exhausted now, I sat down in the dirt in front of the tent and I tried to collect myself. Daddy? Daddy, where are you? My five-year-old shouted. That got me out of my daze. I picked myself up and went into the tent to retrieve him. Putting him in the truck, I locked the doors and I wasted little time breaking down camp. We were out of that camp and back on the road by the time the sun broke over the horizon. Now, I have no idea what is in those woods. I do plan to camp in that area again, albeit without my family, and definitely with some friends this time, because I really want to find out more about this thing. Thankfully, my son doesn't seem phased by anything that happened that night. He thinks that I was chasing a bear away from camp, and who knows... Maybe, maybe he's right. I hope he is anyway. My son can't wait to go on another camping trip, but truthfully, I'm thinking that the next family camping trip might actually be at an RV park, or maybe even a motel. After all, that is family camping, right? This just happened and I'm still pretty shaken by all of it. But this evening, whilst putting away some clothes in my closet, I noticed the entry point to my attic had been disturbed and set ajar. I live in a condo with my wife and child. Our master bedroom was a walk-in closet with an access point or lid or whatever to our attic. I don't believe the attic connects with any other condo, but we do share walls with neighbors on both sides. Anyway, as I was folding and putting away laundry this evening, my wife walked in from the connecting bathroom. Our master bedroom's bathroom connects directly across from the walk-in closet, so they face entryways, and went to ask me something when she gasped and said, look up. My blood turned cold immediately, because there it was. The entry point drywall lid was lifted out of place and set ajar, she had been giving our child a bath at that time, basically right there, and I froze for a moment, not really knowing exactly how to handle the situation. I got a hold of myself and dialed 911 while my wife and child went downstairs in a hurry. She got the both of them ready while I stayed on guard watching the entry to the attic crawl space. Police showed up after what I felt like an eternity and checked up there but couldn't find anything. No signs of forced entry or anything, just an obviously lifted up and placed a jar crawl space cover. Now I'm here alone wondering if we just overreacted or what exactly happened. Somebody or something moved that lid, door or cover or whatever you want to call it. That much is for certain. It wasn't bumped or hit by myself or my wife and my child is not able to get anywhere near the access point. Plus, it was like off and moved, not sort of like gently buffeted by the wind or anything. The creepiest part or thing that bothers me though is that I don't know if it was moved from inside the attic or from my closet below. Police said the drywall that connects up there wasn't broken or cut open or anything. Again, I live in a condo with neighbors on both sides and there was no signs of disturbed fiberglass near the entry or around my closet so no one was like obviously crawling around or messing with stuff up there at least. I am seriously thinking about somehow placing a lock on the entry point but I'm not good with that kind of handiwork and wouldn't really even know how to begin cutting or making a sturdier lid or access to even try to put a lock on one. And I know that this may not be considered paranormal to most but... Weirdly, I had a dream about a similar situation a couple of weeks to a month or so ago. In my dream, a woman called me seemingly on a random day and said bluntly, is there someone inside of your house? 
I panicked and rushed everyone in my house out of the door. I had my wife out the front with my kid, but I also had other family members over that day, so not exactly the same situation, and I can't remember if we found anyone or anything in that day in my dream. But yeah, it's been a, a really strange night to say the least. Thanks for listening, and if you have any advice on my situation, then that would be greatly appreciated. So I went out to one of those sort of abusive wilderness programs for troubled teens when you're backpacking through the Utah desert. And while out there, we stayed one night near some Native American ruins. Before we settled into our camp, we went to go to look at them and were told, like we always were around sites like this, not to touch anything, only to look and definitely do not take anything. Majority of us did just that. We looked around a bit while being respectful for maybe 15 minutes and then went back to our camp to finish doing what we needed to do. We were sleeping in an A-line shelter that night, so we were all in a straight line side by side. Because it was an A-line shelter, both ends were just open to the darkness, and because we had one male staff and one female staff, both adults had to be on one end with the female separating the rest of us from the male, consequently leaving the kids on the other end completely exposed. But anyways, the rest of the evening was pretty uneventful and we went to sleep like normal. In the middle of the night, I got awoken up by the kid to my left shaking me awake, telling me that they keep hearing something hitting our shelter. I'd been out there for a decent amount of time at that point, and immediately told her that it was probably just an animal or the wind making a branch hit it or something, and to just ignore it and go back to sleep. She was super insistent though that it couldn't be any of those things, and begged me to stay up for a few minutes to hear what she was talking about. So I agreed under the condition that she would go back to sleep and leave me alone if I didn't hear anything in five minutes. I don't even think it was a full minute after I said that, before something hit against the side of our tent, right at my feet very hard. It sounded like someone opened palms slapped the side of our tent in fact, hard enough that we saw the top sort of bow in under the pressure. We sat in complete silence listening to whatever it was circling our shelter and periodically slapping it in the different places, first by my feet, then my staff's feet, then their heads, then my head, before moving to slap above the heads of the kids, who apparently took the pottery from that place before circling to slap at their feet. It just kept going around and around and we started trying to figure out what to do. I told her to wake up the staff and that was when she told me that she tried waking them up first before she woke me up and that they had told her to just go back to sleep and ignore it. We decided that the best thing to do was to wake up the girl to my right and tell her what was going on. She stayed awake and heard the slapping that we were hearing and then tried waking up the staff, telling them that we weren't joking and that there could be someone in our camp. They didn't take her seriously either, telling us to stop making things up and to let them sleep. At that response, the girl to my right just said to heck with it, that if we were going to be killed by a madman, she'd rather it happen in her sleep anyway. Real of her, to be honest. And she rolled over and did just that. I didn't know what else to do, so I told the kid who woke me up that the girl to my right was probably onto something and that we should just try to get some sleep. While I was telling her this, her eyes sort of shifted to where she was looking past me over my shoulder, and she got this look that I'll never forget before saying, my name, there's someone standing at the end of our tent. I nearly wet myself in that moment. I really did not want to look, but I knew I had to, so I turned around and saw the silhouette of a man standing just on the other side of the tree that the top line to our shelter was tied to, I remember the first kid asking me, what do we do? And the only thing that I could think of was to wake up everyone to my right and pull them all as tight as we could inside of our shelter. And so that's what we did. We all stayed up, packed together like sardines, listening to this thing circle our shelter for hours until we each finally fell asleep. 
It wasn't until the next morning that we found out that a couple of kids that had lagged behind at the ruins the day before took pieces of pottery and hid them in their sleeping bags. We immediately made them return them and apologize. And we never had anything like that happen again after that. I'll be honest though, I don't know if it scares me more to think that it was paranormal or that there was actually a man in our camp that deep in a national park in the winter like that in the dead of night. When I was a kid, probably around 12 to 13, my mum moved out to this farmhouse in the middle of nowhere. Like, well, we couldn't get internet middle of nowhere. It was a property with 13 acres, a dilapidated barn and horse corral that had overgrown weeds, and of course the main farmhouse. At night, there were no lights other than the one in the front yard to show that our electricity was working. My room had a window that faced the horse corral. Now one night, I woke up in the middle of the night. It was a full moon and I looked out of my window, and beside one of the fence posts of the corral, there was a a girl standing there. She was wearing a nightgown and rubber boots. She was facing my window. From there, things seemed to get worse as well. The TV that we had in our basement would turn on and off randomly. My mum would hear an old radio playing in the middle of the night. My stepmom would go out to the barn to smoke and one time she was in there, she heard a girl say her name. She thought that it was me, but at that time I was at my dad's house in the city. When I would wake up in the middle of the night to pee or to get some water or whatever, I would feel like someone was watching me. If I looked into our living room, it felt like someone was watching me through the window. One day, my stepmom and I were walking down the hallway, and we both saw a nightgown go down into the bathroom. When we went to go and check, no one was in there. This all came to a head though one night when I woke up randomly again in the middle of the night. I used to keep my room door open and it would look out to the hallway of our house. I was laying in bed, unable to fall back asleep when, as clear as day, I heard a girl whisper my name. At first I thought that it was a noise that my sheets made when I moved. I tried recreating the noise, but it didn't work. Then I looked out into the hallway and standing in my doorway was a dark figure of a girl wearing a nightgown. I stared at it, unable to move. I turned on my bedside lamp and when I did, nobody was there. It honestly took everything in my body to run down the hallway into my mum's room where I slept for the night, but eventually I got there. For unrelated reasons, we moved out of the house shortly after that, which to be honest, at that point, I was very grateful for. My family moved around a lot when I was a child, mainly due to my dad's job. We moved four to five times before I was six years old. My mum wanted some stability for the family, which at this point comprised of her, my dad, myself, and my younger brother. So in 1994, my old man went and bought an old derelict farm that was situated in a rural area in the southwest of the UK, a mile from the nearest village and a quarter mile from our neighbors. He purchased it at a property auction and we had no prior viewing, just the pictures on display at the auction house. This place was really old and comprised of a few large fields and two interconnected yards filled with outbuildings and a derelict house. It had been a working farm in various forms for 500 years or so and the house itself was 250 years old. We spent a year living elsewhere whilst the renovations took place but would often go there at weekends to run around and play. The first day we entered the dusty, half-collapsed, two-story house, we realized that the previous occupants had left loads of their stuff behind. The house had been vacated 25, maybe 30 years prior. Everything was dusty, moldy, and falling to pieces. Some of the highlights, though, were dressing tables filled with old clothes and makeup, a wall in one room was plastered with rosettes, one in a queen competitions, and hanging from the banister at the top of the stairs were a row of small string nooses covered in fur. 
It's a barbaric but not uncommon way for farm folk to get rid of unwanted kittens, apparently. Now, this wasn't paranormal in any way, but man, it was an unnerving thing to see in an already creepy looking house. It would take far too long to list everything that happened, so I'll just try to list some highlights below before ending with what I consider to be the strongest occurrence that happened there. So, we had loud bangs, loud enough to make you think that someone had tipped over a wardrobe or something. Footsteps running up and down the long wooden hallway were common. Cold spots and breezy points throughout the house that changed from day to day. One night, my grandparents were house-sitting, and before they went to bed, they did a quick look check. One room at the end of the house was filled with thick mist. It was a clear night. All doors and windows were shut, and... The mist was exclusive to that room. They just noped it out of there and stayed at their own place that night. But the next day, everything was back to normal. After living there for six months, my mum actually called the village priest in to bless the place. We weren't a religious family by any means, but she was really at a loss about how to cope with everything. The priest arrived and then proceeded to sprinkle holy water in every room of the house. Once that was done... Mum walked out to his car and as soon as they got out of the house, he turned to her and said, There's an incredibly dark presence in this house and I'm never setting foot here again. I don't know what to suggest. I'm really sorry, but good luck. And then he got into his car and just sped off. He had apparently been fairly neutral during the blessings, but as soon as he got out of that house, he went pale and his whole demeanor changed instantly. Things got a lot more chill after a medium came around and told mum to kind of embrace it, which she did. But there was always this nagging feeling that we were just never alone there. It didn't feel malevolent, but it felt sort of observational and sometimes sad in a sort of wistful way. Still very strange, but anyway, the weirdest thing that happened actually occurred during the renovation phase. Dad and his work crew had removed all of the old possessions from the house and made a huge bonfire in the yard. They burned it over the course of a few days until it was just a steaming pile of ash. The following weekend, my mum took me and my bro over for a picnic and run around. We were feral little things and needed it. At one point, mum sat in the chair not far from the bonfire and noticed an envelope on the big mound of ash. And despite being in the center of this pile... The envelope had inexplicably not burned up. Mum could tell that there was something heavier than paper in the envelope and when she opened it up, an amethyst crystal dropped out along with a letter. The date on the letter was sometime in the early 60s and was written by the childhood sweetheart of a girl who had lived at the house with her parents. It was a letter of condolence to the parents because it turns out the girl had sadly committed suicide in her room when she was around the age of 18. Her ex-boyfriend had heard about it and sent the parents a really sweet letter expressing his love, grief, and condolences. He also sent the amethyst crystal as that was apparently the girl's favorite stone. Well, my bedroom had been the girl's room apparently. This was evident from the contents when we first got there. My wardrobe was in the corner by the window looking out over the farm. I could never linger there for too long because that part of the room just felt really unpleasant and sort of tense, I guess. I've since wondered if that's the spot where the girl took her life or not. And while the story of the letter isn't very paranormal, the fact that the letter survived the bonfire is just kind of crazy to me. And obviously the contents and all is a bit weird too. So, yeah, we lived there for six years or so and then moved again after my parents split up. The house has changed hands at least twice in the last 20 years. I live about two hours from this place nowadays and my girlfriend and I are really tempted to go and visit and see how it's going. And I mean, I'm sure the owners would just love to be regaled with odd anecdotes about the property, right? Just to clarify too... Aside from the weird feelings and the random bangs and noises, my brother and I were largely unaware of things that happened there. But we were only told later in life, thank the Lord, because honestly, if I had known that at that time, I would have been an absolute mess.
So, for starters, I live near the Appalachian Mountains, which honestly makes this probably more disturbing. I'm a pretty avid runner. I've been quitting a lot of bad habits lately, and exercise just does the trick for me. I have a greenway behind my house that I go and run or bike rides on. It's very beautiful, and during the day, plenty of people are there as well. Well, about a week ago, I ran through the greenway to stop by a friend's house and grab something. By the time I got back onto the greenway, the sun was already starting to set and the path was getting dark. As I was walking back through the path, I had my flashlight on and kept looking around me. I felt paranoid being alone in the dark, but as I was walking, I distinctly remember hearing my grandma's voice call my name into the tree line. It sounded so real and normal that I turned around instantly, only to immediately go cold realizing that my grandma was dead. This freaked me out, but I tried my best to somewhat convince myself that I was just hallucinating because I was paranoid. Only uh, about a minute later, I turned around behind me with my flashlight out of fear, and that was when I saw it. It looked like a, a gray blob, pretty much just like a human sprinting at you full speed in the pitch black. I screamed, and I don't think I've ever run so fast in my life. When I got back home, I tried to laugh it off as just me seeing stuff and just being a little scaredy cat. But about a week later, and I still could not stop thinking about it. It sounded so real. I mean, I heard her voice clear as day, and the person chasing me looked so real as well. I've heard all of those stories about skinwalkers, and while I doubt their existence, my experience was so similar to that of skinwalker encounters that I'm seriously beginning to question myself. What do you guys think? Is it possible my brain was just hallucinating out of fear and anxiety, or is there something more to this? I'm from the UK, and way back in 2016, when the whole killer clown epidemic was huge, I was walking through the woods at around 10pm alone in order to get to a party or a gathering that was happening in a secluded part of the forest. It was almost pitch black, and I could barely see in front of me besides the flash of my phone, and everything seemed normal as I was walking to the party. I got to a long stretch of woods with no defined path, but it was the quickest way to the party, so I took it. As I got around maybe midway through, I heard something to my left. I turned and saw a shadowy figure sat on a fallen log. I was understandably unnerved, but I couldn't make out if it was just shadows from the moonlight or if it was an actual person. I made the mistake of shining my phone light directly at it, and I was instantly terrified. Sat there, alone in the middle of the woods in complete darkness, was a largish man, dressed as a clown, with full face paint and sporting the creepiest smile imaginable. I tried to call five different people as I was passing him, and then I heard him get up behind me. I instantly started sprinting towards the end of the long stretch onto a path which had a barbed wire fence down the side of it. During the sprint, I was pretending to be on the phone with one of my friends and I could hear him running after me but there was no chance in heck that I would be turning around to see if I was right. When I got to the path, I jumped over the fence as fast as I could and sliced my hands open as I did so. I turned around and kept running backwards as I saw the clown stood behind the fence just staring at me and smiling. I didn't stop running until I got to the party and I was scared for a very long time after this too. You have to bear in mind that there were so many rumors of people being killed by people dressed as clowns at that time and while I will never know if the man had evil intentions or was just trying to scare me, it was still extremely strange and scary to live through. So first, uh, a bit of context. My cousin was tragically murdered not too long ago, and in the days leading up to this horrific event, his nieces and nephews 
had some inexplicable experiences. One of his nieces, visibly upset, was found crying and clutching a photograph of him, telling her mum how much she missed him on the very day that he was murdered. It was as though she knew something terrible was about to happen. Another niece had a chilling encounter as well. The night of his murder, she claims to have seen a shadow dart across her room. She described it as a swift, unexplainable presence that sent shivers down her spine. But perhaps the most puzzling incident involved one of our nephews. Out of the blue, he started yelling, no, I don't want anyone from my family to die, repeatedly, without any apparent trigger or context. It was as if he was sensing something that we couldn't. We couldn't help but wonder if these strange occurrences were somehow connected to my cousin's murder. It almost felt as though he was saying a final goodbye to the newest generation of her family, visiting each of them before departing this world in a, a really tragic way. I'm wondering though, has anyone else experienced or heard of similar bizarre events surrounding the murder of a loved one? It's as if the boundaries between this world and the next are thinner than we might think. And these unexplained phenomena really only add to the mystery. So this happened years ago when I was a dumb teen girl who loved walking the city alone after dark. This took place in Eastern Europe, for context in a city with a tramway system. So on this one night, I sat in a tram station waiting to catch the last tram home. Three trams stopped at this station, two of which went where I was going. It was around 10pm and as I sat there waiting, lost in thought, I barely registered a man quietly walking up and standing by the shelter. I didn't think anything of it, just somebody else waiting for the tram like me. Until I started feeling weird. The streets were quiet and dark and there was no one else in sight, just me and this guy. And I started wondering why he chose to stand this close to me when he had so much space to avoid dealing with people at all. I couldn't comprehend anyone wanting to socialize this late at night, given that I was not very social myself. So I sort of glanced at him, trying not to overthink it. He was a bald-headed guy, beady-eyed, giant, tall and built like a bear, big belly and big arms and legs. I was 5'2 and scrawny, but that wasn't what scared me. It was the fact that he was staring right at me when I looked at him, unblinking and expressionless, not even attempting to look away or act embarrassed. No, this guy wanted me to feel uncomfortable. I instantly felt weak and shaky, cold shivers down my spine. This was not normal. I realized quickly that I was not in a good situation. I couldn't miss the last tram, but walking home was out of the question, and my phone was almost dead too. I was a shy kid and I didn't have what it takes to scare this guy away. I knew that, but I had to try at least. I only managed to utter a small hi, trying my best to startle him out of whatever he was thinking. But my attempts failed in the face of his silent, threatening aura. He kept staring, no sign of intent to reply. He was enjoying this, feeling the panic rising inside of me. I told myself to stay calm and to think rationally. I mean, maybe he didn't hear me. Minutes passed, his stare continued to burn on my skin, and there was still no tram in sight. Ignoring him didn't seem to work either, so I mustered the courage to speak once again, this time louder. What do you want? Stop staring. No answer. He definitely heard me this time. I felt myself start to get angry. I didn't want to let this guy get to me anymore. I didn't want to continue to give him the satisfaction of watching me squirm nervously and pretend that his behavior didn't bother me. I took a deep breath and forced myself to start thinking. I knew what I can't do. I mean, I couldn't fight him off if he makes a move, and there's nothing I can say or do that will get him to stop. I didn't know what his intentions were, but I knew that they weren't good. If I tried to walk away, he would probably follow. I could run, but 
He would most likely catch up to me before I can tire him out, since his legs were much longer than mine. If I managed to somehow lose him, walking home through dark alleys past the junkies and gypsies that were always prowling about anyway could land me in an even worse situation. I could pretend to call someone, but he might feel compelled to act much stronger and sooner if he felt threatened. So what can I do? The only thing that I could realistically be able to do was to try and outsmart him somehow. So I started developing a few plans. Depending on which tram showed up, trying to confirm whether he was just amusing himself and actually waiting for a tram too, or popped over for other more suspicious reasons, and whether I get any kind of help, I couldn't let him see where I lived, so if he followed me, I'd have to be prepared to employ whatever strategy available, and for that, I needed to stay rational and aware of my surroundings. While I was still thinking though, the first tram showed up. It was one that I could have taken home, but this one pulled into the depot right in my neighborhood, forcing me to lead him to my home. I hoped that he would board it and just leave me be, but of course he didn't. He kept watching me carefully instead. I let the tram go, desperately hoping that it wasn't the last one to head home. He continued to watch and I sensed that he was quite happy with how things were going. I put up with it for another 15 minutes, trying to focus on another plan of action. I could now pretend that I needed the other tram, the one going to a different area of the city, and just ride to the next station, getting off as soon as possible, so I don't end up too far and miss the tram that I need. This tram showed up next, so with my heart in my throat, I boarded it and sat down by the door. He got on it too but sat himself at the back, pretty far from where I was. I let out a sigh of relief, thinking that this might still go well. When the tram reached the next station, I got up and out, not looking back and hoping that it was all over. But when I stepped onto the pavement and watched the tram drive away, I couldn't see him in it. I turned my head slowly and was terrified to see him walking towards me, looking slightly ticked off at this point. He stopped just a few steps away and resumed staring, this time with a clear hint of malice, still in silence. My vision blurred as I fought back tears of despair. He was not going to let me go at this point. The helplessness that I felt was unbearable, but I couldn't cry. I couldn't give up. I had to find a way. I had to get home tonight. The prospect of what might happen to me any time now if I didn't was becoming very real. My head was full of unanswered questions, regrets and horrible scenarios. I wanted so badly to not have to think anymore, to not have to fight back the tears and stay composed, but I knew that this would be his cue to enact whatever messed up plan that he had in mind, and I could not let that happen. Then I saw the final tram approach the only one that I could take now, and I got on as quickly as my trembling legs would allow me to. When I was in, bright lights enveloping me, my mind snapped out of this nightmarish spiral of fear and allowed me a moment of clarity. I had three stops to figure this out. I sat down at the front and looked at the driver. He was a frail old guy, blissfully unaware of my distress. Getting the driver's attention was pretty much a no-go as well. We passed one stop. There was no one else waiting to climb aboard. I turned around fully expecting to see that the psycho had followed me again, but I did not expect him to be sitting right behind me. He was not taking any chances now. He was making sure that I won't try anything like last time. I shot him a hateful glare and allowed my anger to overcome my fear. I stood up and purposefully walked over to another seat in the middle of the tram car, I wanted to make it clear that I will not put up with this any longer. He got up too and slowly walked up to a spot, two seats behind and diagonally from me, then sat down with the tiniest arrogant grin on his face. Already expecting it, I shot up and stood by the middle door instead, determined to keep him on his toes. If I stood right by the door, he won't have any idea which station that I plan to get off at. He remained where he was this time, convinced that I was bluffing. 
After all, this was really the last tram and there was nothing else that I could possibly do to escape now. He must have reckoned this, so my defiance was just a funny act to him. This, though, was my chance. I had to take the risk and it had to work. There were three doors on the tram and they all opened and closed at the same time and stayed open for around five seconds before closing again if no buttons were pressed or people detected on the threshold. The next stop, the only one left before mine, came into view. The tram slowed to a stop, the doors opened, and I made my move. Five long seconds passed, the door started to close, I bolted out and ran for it, reaching the back door as fast as I could and slamming the button to open it again. My whole body tensed with adrenaline. I waited a long, painful second, then jumped back in, keeping my head low, holding my breath and crouching behind the nearest seat. I shut my eyes tightly and exhaled slowly while thanking the gods that I didn't believe in for the button working, and wishing with all my might for him to have not seen me before I got back in. As I was waiting to hear his footsteps approaching, I pictured him frantically looking for me, was he still on the tram, face screwed up in anger, head turning like a fat, ugly meerkat? Or was he catching his breath on the pavement of the last station, mad eyes searching the darkness for me? As the tram continued its loud journey, banging and clanging in sync with my heartbeat, I dared smile to myself, imagining his face when he realized that he had messed up. Hand on my chest... I did my best to stealthily look around the corner and found no one looking back. I stood up in excitement and threw myself at the foggy back window and there he was, standing alone and victimless on that slowly fading out of sight station, watching me leave him and his vile plans behind. Giving someone the middle finger never felt so good. I made it home and told no one my story, for fear that I'd be admonished for my naivety, but I was safe, and I was proud of myself, and most importantly, I learned my lesson. So my parents opened up a haunted house in my dad's shop, I know, a bit weird, and we had a few actors. Names were obviously... I'll change the name so as to hide the identities, but the actors were me, my dad, my mum, my sister, bear, ghost face, cheerleader, alien, prisoner, doll, and skeleton. I know it's a lot, but let me explain how the setup was. So, the shop has a store in the front, a gym in the middle, storage in the back. Dad would lead the patron into the storefront and ring the bell to let us know to get ready. Then the patron would pass bear and ghost face... Then they would get jump scared by cheerleader, me and the prisoner, and then pass through the rest. Alien would follow them all the way through as well. Simple. So, when we were near the end of our time, Dad led in a guy. You know, like normal, and I don't want to profile him, but he seemed to be of Arabic descent, or perhaps Muslim, because he seemed to be wearing his clothes like, you know, the clothes that they wear or whatever. But this guy shall be known as the creepy guy. I think now I should mention most of us are minors as well. Sister, bear, ghost face and skeleton are middle schoolers and cheerleader, alien and I are high schoolers. Anyway, creepy guy touched bear's shoulder and also pulled a knife on bear and ghost face. After he passed them, he didn't notice cheerleader but grabbed alien and scratched his arm. After that, he stared at prisoner and ignored him. He then started speaking in a different language. It sounded like chanting, but I don't know, towards Skeleton, Doll, and my sister, but Mum then ran him off. We were on edge for the rest of the night, and it was a really weird experience. I don't know what he actually said when he was speaking, and if he was threatening us or what, but the whole thing was very strange and, quite honestly, downright scary. Back when I lived in the rural Midwest, about 10 years ago, I lived in a house right off of the highway. My house was right between one town and another, almost right on the county line. So our house had a big circle driveway. If you drove in the driveway, you would be going straight towards our barn. If you curved right, you could pull into our garage. 
If you went past the garage, you could circle around in front of the house and pull back out where you started. Our house had two large double doors in front, which we rarely used. We always used the door that was inside the garage. And one night, it was very late and my doorbell rang. My husband and my three-year-old daughter and I were all asleep. It woke me up and I thought maybe I was dreaming at first, but it rang again. I woke my husband up. He thought that I was hearing things until it rang again. It was very dark outside, but we have a dusk to dawn light, so most of the driveway is pretty well lit up. Unfortunately, you can't really see the front doors unless you open the door and look out. You can open just one at a time, or you can open them both by using two latch-like things that are in the top of the bottom of one of the doors. But anyway, my husband gets up and I follow him. He decides that he's going to open the door. I want to call the cops, but because we live on the county line, we know it's going to be a while before they can get there. So in the end, he opens the door to a girl, maybe early 20s. She looks normal, except for the fact that she's standing at my door in the middle of the night. I look past her and her car is pulled into my driveway just off of the road, not up to the house, not around the circle. She says that she needs to use the phone. She says that her car battery died or something. She's not sure, but she can't get it to start. I told my husband, no way. This is how horror movies start, and we offered to call the cops, which would be the county sheriff. She asks over and over, but I'm not letting her in. We tell her that we will call, and she kind of stomps off. We watch her walk back to the car, maybe 50 feet away. I'm a bad judge of distance, so sorry. But I can see her car and I can see her. I call the cops. They say that they'll be there as soon as they can. About 15 minutes. They don't sound very concerned. And at this point, I'm not really either, I guess. I mean, it's just a girl and she's apparently broken down. She probably just does have a dead battery after all. But then she opens the trunk. No lights come on and she rummages around in the trunk. Then the driver's side door opens and out steps a guy. Then the back passenger door opens. Out steps one more guy. They all rummage around the trunk. No lights on. I can't hear anything. I can't hear them talking and I can't tell what they're doing. They all get back in the car eventually. And at this point, maybe five minutes have gone by. I am silently praying that the sheriff puts his foot on the gas and gets here quickly, but I know it's going to be another 10 minutes or so at least. And they just sit there, in the car, lights off, not moving. I can't see them when they're in the car, but I know that they're in there. I also know that they didn't get out of the car and walk past the house because they would have had to have walked right under the dusk to dawn light. I would have seen them, in other words. I think that I see the driver's light, a smoke or whatever, and that part I'm not sure about, but... Then I see something, or someone, walking towards the car from the right, coming from the direction of the barn. It's a man. I have no idea who this man is. We don't have a neighbor for at least a mile, and he's coming from the back of my property, which ends in a creek. He walks under the dusk to dawn light, straight to the car. He doesn't look at the house, he just walks to the car and gets in the back. Then the car starts up and they slowly back out of my driveway and head north. The cops arrive about 10 minutes later and at this point I am freaking out. They search around but can't find anything. They ask us if we got a license plate but they were parked too far away to see and they tell us to call if they come back. Sure buddy, thanks. But my husband goes and he gets his shotgun from the shop on our property and we just try to go back to sleep. They never do come back and I don't know who those people were and I don't know what they wanted, but they were definitely up to something. And I know that whatever it was, was not good. Ever since I was a kid, I remember my grandma denouncing horror of any kind ghoulish Halloween masks, haunted houses, scary movies. I had attributed this aversion to her background and faith. She's Hispanic and a devout Catholic. 
She believes that anything horror related is wrong, evil, you name it. So imagine my shock and curiosity when my grandparents shared a bombshell. Back in 1974, my grandpa convinced my grandma to see the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. This would be her first and last scary movie. The weekend after the movie, my grandpa, grandma, my then toddler age mother, and my aunts and uncles decided that they'll go horseback riding for the first time. Since everyone lived in Wisconsin, my family made the journey to a farm about two hours away. For the most part, everyone is in high spirits. And I mean, who can say no to a family adventure on a crisp autumn Wisconsin day? Despite the other's excitement, my grandma is worried. Since she doesn't care for horses, she chooses to stay behind as well, on her own with my mother. When my family arrives at the farm, it is three o'clock at this point. According to my grandma, she watched everyone get saddled up and then slowly ride off into the tangle of trees. The guide leading my family called out that the ride would last less than two hours, mentioning different trails, the need for breaks and all that, things of that nature. My grandma figures everyone will be back by five o'clock. She waits with my mother in the car, playing games, reading storybooks, and trying to silence her bubbling anxiety. Needless to say, five o'clock comes and goes, and no sign of my family. By this time, my mother has fallen asleep, which leaves my grandma with no way to distract herself from her worries. Finally, though, when six o'clock rolls around, she calls to a farmhand from her car window. No way is she leaving the safety of a vehicle, but she demands to know why her family hasn't returned yet, when five o'clock has long since passed. By now, darkness has begun bleeding into the Wisconsin sky. The farmhand assures her that everything is okay and that extra paths are taken throughout the ride. He tells her that her family should return very soon. Now, keep in mind that this was all before cell phones were a thing. Also, a week before, she had seen her first scary movie, and it had scared her half to death at this point. My poor grandma feels like she's living out a scene from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. As she tries to contain her worry and begins a hushed, fearful prayer, until the flash of lightning that is soon followed by ear-splitting thunder occurs. The noise wakes my mother, who starts to cry. My grandma must now not only ponder the frightening question of where her family went, she also has a stressed, howling two-year-old to deal with as well. It is now reaching seven o'clock. The storm is growing more ferocious by the second. My grandma has to pee and her bladder feels like it's going to explode. But between the roar of the storm and the images of crazed country maniacs plaguing her mind, she refuses to leave the vehicle. She plans in her head that if they aren't back by 7.30, she's going to leave and find the nearest gas station to phone for help. Again, there's no cell phones during these days. And 7.30 arrives, her family hasn't come out of the woods yet. As she's scrambling around the car for the keys, she realizes my grandpa never gave them to her. The pound of a fist against her window shakes her from her whirlwind of panic. That panic amplifies by a million when she notices a sizable brawny man peering in at her. He's wearing a jacket and the hood covers his head. My grandma says that by now it felt like someone had pushed a button and sent the world into slow motion. Everything crawled by at a snail's pace. Why don't you and your little one come inside? The man yells. His words are authoritative though and carry no hint of warmth. He isn't speaking from a place of concern. He's ordering my grandma into the farmhouse. All my grandma can do is shout, Where is my family? The man responds gruffly, We're looking for them. My grandma orders him to call the police. The next words the man said made my grandma literally pee her pants. We don't need the police, is what he said. As he turns to go back into his house, he says, you and the baby can come inside whenever you're ready. My grandma starts to sob, wholly convinced that her family has been brutally murdered and that she and her baby will be next. In the chaos of this moment, she hears someone calling her name, but because of the pitch black darkness and her profound fear, she knows that she must be hearing things. Then she hears her name again, this time even louder. Dora, help me. 
it's my grandpa's voice. When she realizes this, she puts my mum in the back seat, grabs the wooden baseball bat my grandpa keeps under his seat, locks the doors, and then exits the car. Keep calling my name, I can't see you, she cries. After what feels like an eternity, she follows my grandpa's voice to his location. When she gets to him, she realizes that my grandpa needed help because he is guiding my aunt across the high, rain-soaked grass. She had accidentally hurt her ankle as well. They're both drenched from mud and rain and covered in scratches. The rest of my family is nowhere in sight at this point though. Before my grandma can assume the worst, she hears my uncle calling for my grandpa. One by one, everyone shuffles out of the wild woods and through the tall grass. Everyone is soaked in mud and injured in some capacity. Cuts, gashes, limping, unsteady, all are shaken as well. But when they finally make it back to their vehicles, the sounds of running engines and the flood of headlights gets the attention of the man inside the farmhouse. The farmhouse door swings open and the brawny man comes standing on the porch. With an amused chuckle, he drawls, Oh, you all made it out of there. My grandpa shouts, That guy left us out there and never came back. All the man says in response is, I'll have to talk to him about that. You all can come inside. His freakishly flippant and joking attitude sinks into his words. He knows very well that they aren't going into his house. My grandma begs my grandpa to leave it and get them out of there. And with that, my family tears out of there as fast as humanly possible. Once my family was back home and safe, my grandpa explained what had happened. So during the ride, the guide led them into a deep part of the woods to a creek where the horses stopped for a drink. As the horses rested, the guide told my family that he had to do something and would be back in 20 minutes. My family thought that this was a bit strange and my grandpa even anxiously joked, you're coming back, right? The guide simply gave a low chuckle and took off on his horse. The 20 minutes came and went and the guide didn't return. My family continued to wait as they had no idea where to go. They could see the sky blackening above them and they would have to make it out of there on their own at this point. As my family rode off, they tried to remember the path back to the farm. They wandered aimlessly, and eventually the rain started to fall. Pulsing lightning and crash of thunder spooked the horses. Everyone but my grandpa got thrown off their horses. When my grandpa climbed off of his horse to help the others, his own horse galloped away as well. And from there, it was a nightmare trying to navigate the woods while wounded and roaming through a thick void of darkness like that. It is something that my grandma has never forgotten, and they often talk about what the intentions of those guys actually were. I guess the only advice I can give you is this. Be careful about things like this, because what seems like an innocent day can turn into an absolute nightmare. I lived in a very small town from the age of five to six, but we didn't stay there long. Not because of anything that happened, but my parents just wanted to move to the city. I don't remember hardly anything from this age, but every memory that I can think of has to do with something scary that actually happened. To set the scene, we lived on some land in a house that was built in possibly the 50s or 60s. I tried to do some research to find out exactly, but I can't seem to find anything at this point. If I do, I'll make sure that I update you. After finding out the address from my parents, I put it into Google Maps and realized that our house was only about a mile or two away from the church where I had the experience from my last post. The church has also been around since about 1873 and has a graveyard attached to it as well. On the land is our house, a very creepy barn, and a pasture full of cows that belong to our landlord. My dad let me know that we used the barn for storage, and this cleared up one of my experiences. It was most definitely a dream, but the dream still freaks me out anyways. So to start with my dream, I remember for some reason that I went into the barn. Me and my brothers usually stayed away from there because there were a lot of like rusty tools and it honestly just looked scary to be honest, but 
When I walked into the barn, I could see the middle part of the floor was slightly raised for storage underneath. After talking to my dad, he said the barn didn't have any underground storage, but I remember looking down into the floor and seeing two kids around my age playing in the underground section. I also recall them inviting me down with them there. Since I know that the floor wasn't raised, I'm wondering what this could mean. It was most definitely a dream, but why? Anyway, so this next thing happened in the house and bear with me because there's a bit. So my two older brothers shared a room and had their own bed in either side of the room. I believe that whatever was in the house, it seemed to target them the most since I don't really remember anything happening to me there. But my oldest brother told us one time that he was trying to fall asleep when suddenly he felt someone pushing against the mattress underneath him. Of course, he thought that it was our other brother messing with him, but when he looked under the bed, there was nothing and nobody there. Both of my brothers also mentioned many times that they would see feet in their closet at night. They would leave the light on in there but close the door and could see someone's feet blocking the light. Of course, when they opened the door, there was nothing there. They also have talked about hearing scratches on the door. And while I was talking to my mum about all of this, she told me about one night where she couldn't find my second oldest brother. She searched the house and couldn't find him anywhere until she found him asleep under his bed. Now, he's never been known to sleepwalk, so that was really odd. My oldest brother also told me a while ago about how every once in a while my older brother would sit up in bed and stare at the wall in front of him in the middle of the night. He would tell him to lay down and go to sleep but got ignored. Of course, he never remembered sitting up in his bed like this but that was also a bit strange. The last thing I remember is that my oldest brother had a huge bin of Legos that he always kept under his bed. And some nights, he would hear the Legos being shuffled around down there. Of course, he always thought that it was my other brother until he saw him asleep in his bed. My oldest brother passed away two years ago, so I won't be able to ask him about anything anymore, but I'll try to talk to my other brother about it. He's not much older than me, so there's a good chance that he doesn't remember either, especially since he was asleep when, well, pretty much anything happened to him. Also, uh, a quick little mention as well is that the cows, they just did not act normal at all. I don't know if this has anything to do with paranormal activity, but they seem to always be terrified of humans and ran away any time that you came close. Usually cows are pretty friendly, kind of like a big dog I guess, but no one ever believes me when I talk about any of this. So I'm glad that I found this space where people just, well, listen I guess. I don't doubt that any of this happened. The town that I lived in was the first settlement in my state and it has a very deep history. It all makes more sense now after I found out that we live so close to the church as well. Currently, I live about an hour away from the house. I'm almost tempted to try and contact whoever owns it now and see if I can visit or ask if they've experienced anything themselves. Odds are, the house and the barn are no longer there, and when I looked at the property, it says the house is bigger than it was when we lived there, so I think they may have torn it down and built a new home anyway. Probably not a good idea to go back, but I am definitely curious and... What do you guys think? Should I? When I was around the age of six, my mum started to clean our church every week to help out. During this time, we were renting a farmhouse where me and my two older brothers experienced quite a few paranormal events, but my parents never gave it the light of day due to them being very Christian and conservative. Now one day my mum was cleaning the church and my brothers and I sort of tagged along since my dad was working that day. While my mum cleaned we decided to play hide and seek since the church was empty. Eventually I was the seeker looking for my brother and I remember walking down a long hallway. Since the church was closed and my mum was just cleaning the room where the sermons were held, all the other lights were off except for the emergency lights. When I was walking in the very dim hall, for some reason I felt the need to look up and from that moment I 
cannot get the image of what I saw out of my head. There was an all-black figure around the size of a six or seven-year-old. The figure was crawling on the ceiling, so I was looking at its back. Only it had noticed me, so it had twisted its head all the way around to see me. The face was blurry since it was dark, but I could make out an almost like cartoonish smile staring at me and I remember its eyes being not human-like at all. The weird thing about this is despite how creepy I remember the figure being, my six-year-old self was not scared at all. I remember thinking to myself, how did my brother get up there? Then I felt the need to leave the hallway. When I saw its face, I didn't feel my stomach drop, nor did I feel scared or threatened. It just felt like whatever I saw wanted me to just move along. To this day, I don't have any idea what it was. My brothers called me crazy and said, there can't be any demons in a church since it's protected by God, and my parents agreed. The older I got, the more I wondered if it was just a dream that made itself a memory. But it just feels so real when I think about it, and I'm able to describe it in such great detail. I don't really remember any other times that we played hide and seek, but this one sticks out and family remembers this day as well, so there's that. I know children are more likely to have paranormal experiences, and my brother also had things happen to them, but it was at the house, and why did I see something at our church? After doing some research, I found out that the church had been around there since about 1873, and like... I remember there was a cemetery on the land as well with the same name as the church. I'm happy to talk about some other things that happened in the house, but I really don't remember much and the only things my brothers have told me, and that's about it. The house was very old and in the middle of nowhere. It was an old farmhouse that someone purchased and renovated some days back. The barn was a no-no zone and gave us all the creeps. The cows on the land acted very strange as well, and the house just had a, a really weird vibe overall. So in 2019, my brother, my best friend and I were riding our bicycles across the United States to raise money for a cancer charity. Because we were doing this, it meant that we were camping every single night, most often in town parks or campgrounds if they have them. This particular night, in the middle of the trip, we arrived in Napoleon, North Dakota, literally the definition of the middle of nowhere. The evening was entirely normal, until just after the sun went down. As I was laying in my sleeping bag under a pavilion in this town's only park, I could hear the faint noise of, like, radio static, almost like someone was flipping through channels or something, picking up bits and pieces of songs and commercials on the radio, the sound grew louder and louder until it was undeniable and all that my brother and I could hear. Because we had just finished biking 70 miles that day and had 60 more tomorrow, I was pretty angry and wanted my sleep so I left the pavilion to go yell at some loud other camper and as soon as I got up, I noticed two things. One, I looked at my phone for the time and I noticed that it was around 1.30 in the morning now which just wasn't possible because I don't even recall falling asleep and it felt like I literally just got back from dinner at around 8.30. And two, the campsite downtown was totally and completely empty. In fact, the town was dead. By this time, I got a little bit weirded out but decided to continue investigating. I continued following the static and it led me to multiple places around Napoleon. First, it took me to the water tower, then the main street, and finally it was leading me out into this large cornfield on the edge of town. I then realized that this sound was almost shifting in the wind, coming from different places just moments after it came from one direction. I decided not to follow it into the field because, I mean, to heck with that, right? And went back to my sleeping bag to get some sleep. But the most concerning part happened just then. You see, I put in my earbuds to block out the static, and just then the volume of said static only increased. The noise seemed to be coming from inside of my head. 
I know that that sounds really weird to say, but that is honestly the best way to explain it. So, after a restless night, I woke up to a day of cycling 60 miles in a downpour, but my head, thankfully, was finally silent. I asked my brother if he heard the same thing, and he said that he did, but he just assumed that it was another camper. But again, the site and quite literally the entire town was entirely empty. This is unrelated too, but that morning I received news that my childhood dog died, launching me into my first ever experience with grief. Probably unrelated, but it was a, a weird coincidence. Recently, I, a 24-year-old female, was living in a woman's shelter and I made some really good friends there. We used to sit at this park across from a temple at night and drink or smoke or whatever. We'd be there for hours listening to my music, just having fun and talking about our lives. We were all quite young in the group, early 20s. I should say too that we were all there due to a fair amount of trauma in our lives and we connected through that a lot. One night, my friends and I went to a party in the city where we had been drinking for hours and weren't tired when it was over. So when me and my closest friend there, 22 year old female, got back to the shelter, we decided to go sit in the park and watch the sunrise and drink a bit more. We're there for a little while and we suddenly hear R&B or rap music coming from the temple across the street. I might add that we are both mixed black girls and we were pretty tipsy so we thought that it would be a strange adventure to go over there to see who was playing my favorite song so loud in the morning. It could be a potential friend or maybe we'd just learn about the place. Whatever the case, it was a beautiful temple. So we walked over and the gates were locked. We were disappointed but a man comes out to greet us and said that we could come in and see the temple. He said that it was his music and that he loves that we like the same music. So we go in and he sort of shows us around. It's beautiful in the bottom but we also notice a lot of rooms with beds and he tells us that if we ever wanted to rent rooms that we could for unbelievably cheap. And we thought that being homeless girls with not much work that it was really an amazing opportunity. Almost too good to be true. At first, too, I felt nothing but positive vibes. He shows us his computer that's playing the music and asks what songs that we would want to hear. I get comfortable with this guy. He was funny and we all sort of got along pretty well. We're talking about recreational activities that rhymes with weed and so we had some and we offered it to him because he was just really cool and chill. He then says that he'll pack ours with our stuff and that will be more important later. I should add too that he was constantly complimenting me specifically. My hair, my skin color and saying all really forwarded compliments that made me a bit uncomfortable. He started asking if I like Asian men and if I had ever slept with one. He was of Eastern Asian descent. I'm not sure where though but he then went on to ask more questions about my sexual preferences and told us that he would give very bad drugs, don't think that I can say it, to girls to smoke and have sex with them, drugs no one should ever do. He also said that he sees us sitting at the park sometimes through the window, and all of that was becoming a pile of red flags. He then said as we were smoking that if we had another friend, we can also take his room because he's moving soon and... That was when I got a weird feeling, so I decided to ask him why he was leaving if the rent was so cheap. He wouldn't answer, just dodging the question and my intuition was telling me that something was wrong. It's ridiculous it took so long, but I asked if I could have some water and he said to get the one out of the fridge. I went out and there was another guy there and he was nice and offering me the water, but I decided to get a glass and use the tap instead. He runs out of the room my friend was in and says, no, the one from the fridge. And I said, I'm fine with this. He walks me back to the room and I sit back down next to my friend. He then went on to say, 
I'm moving because I hear people screaming and having orgies at night, noises banging on my door, sounds of people being tortured and hurt and it disturbs my sleep. And I mean, like what, right? It was almost like it accidentally slipped out what he had just said. I almost thought that it was a joke to be honest. I asked him if it was nightmares, ghosts or real people that are making these noises at night and he just continued to dodge my questions. I asked why on earth he didn't tell us this earlier. We were honestly in disbelief and he continued to ignore what we were saying and acting really strange. I then noticed that he had closed the door when I came back in earlier and I started to think that we actually needed to get out of here because this was getting dangerous. He then said, you have to listen to this song, you'll love it. It gets worse though. He puts on this terrifying sort of chant or Viking-like song and plays it really loud, too loud, and he's chanting this song so loud that we're yelling at him to turn it off, but he just doesn't listen. The video is Viking like people killing other people or something and we're begging him to turn it off because it's terrifying and why would he or anyone like that sort of thing? I mean, it was barely music. He turns his face to us fast and screams maniacally with his teeth showing. His tongue was out and his eyes were wide too. It was the most distorted face that I'd ever seen. He didn't look human in fact. No sane person would act like that anyway. My fight or flight response isn't really all that good. So I sat there laughing, sort of just frozen in fear I guess. But my friend on the other hand was in fight mode. She threatened to beat this guy up if he didn't let us out right now. I ran to the door and he ran at me so I froze in front of him and he went to open the door because it was locked. We started running out of the house while he laughs maniacally speed walking behind us. We bolted out and mind you, I'm still trying to laugh it off but it was the beginning of the worst panic attack that I'd ever had. If my friend wasn't there in fight mode, I genuinely don't know what would have happened to me. I mean, the way that he changed so quickly, his movements and mannerisms, the way that his face just didn't look human anymore, and how naive we were to go in there in the first place because it seemed like an innocent temple. Well, we didn't get many answers from this situation because, well, quite frankly, we were just too scared to go back or cause problems, which I know is pretty stupid. We don't know if he was truly troubled or if there were actually people there getting hurt, killed and tortured or having orgies or whatever, but it scared me. It scared me to think about the fact that he knew that we were homeless, vulnerable girls at the time, that he may have lured us in with the music that he hears us play. We also were completely tripping because he laced our stuff. I don't think that I can say on here what my friend believed it was, but... It was the worst experience that we had ever had. I highly doubt that those girls that he spoke about in the beginning were there consensually. Let me say that much. When I was 10, my parents decided to move us into an old funeral home. Now, in this house for the five years that I lived in it, I had had some uh, experiences and unexplainable things happen. However, I'm only going to list some that just really stuck with me. So when we first moved into the house, the new owners kept only one item from back when it was a funeral home and it was the organ. This organ was huge, mind you, and very old. I don't know if it's been there the whole 60 years that the funeral home was standing, but I do know that... It had to be in there for a long time. I remember my father saying that we were never to touch it. And being the destructive children that we were, I could understand. So we just never did. However, it did. Let me explain. It started one night early in the evening. The eerie sound of it being played. The sound of the organ was just hauntingly beautiful. Being a child, of course, I'm thinking that my brothers are pulling a prank on me and probably going to get in trouble. However, after the first night, it continued. 
So one night, me and my sister had to catch our brothers in the act, as they swore that they weren't playing it. So when it played again, we went down the stairs ready to bust them, so to speak, only to find that once the music stopped, nobody was there. Now, the funeral home was mostly renovated into an actual house, mostly the downstairs because that used to be where grieving families said their last goodbyes to their loved ones. They really tried to erase a, a history of it ever being one. All of it, except the basement. Now, the basement used to be the place where they prepared the dead bodies, apparently. But let me be clear, too, that they didn't leave the equipment or table or anything down there. This isn't a haunting in Connecticut or something. However, they didn't try to really change up the basement at all either. It was a sort of dark tunnel-like basement with it starting at the entrance. Used to be an office area for the actual house, I think. It was a downslope, like a downward hill from the front to the back. And it was creepy, to say the least. So I just never really went in there. But my parents used it for storage, though, and... One day, my dad asked me to go down there to grab something. I really can't remember what it was, but it was important at the time. So I went down there with a flashlight in hand, because only one light was in there, and I started going through the boxes and rummaging around. As I was looking, I just all of a sudden felt this really weird feeling. Almost like I was being watched or something. I brushed it off, of course, and continued, until... All of a sudden, the temperature in that place just plummeted. It was a hot July day, and it just felt breezy all of a sudden. My hair stood up on ends, and that was when I heard it. It was all I can describe as an unnatural sound. No words to be made out. Just a, a gaggle-like sound in my ear right next to me. I can tell you, though, that I spun around so fast that I'm surprised I didn't get whiplash to see nothing. But at that, I ran. I ran for dear life up the ramp-like pavement to the used-to-be store-like front, and I just refused to ever go back down there. Now, I can say the worst part of living there was the nighttime because of the nightmares. Mostly every night... I really wouldn't remember all of them, just know that I would wake up screaming and scared to go back to sleep. One time I did remember though, and, well, I remember the voice. I was dead asleep, and I was woken up by a loud voice screaming, wake up. I looked around my room, but nobody was there. My father would say that it was just night terrors, but till this day in my heart, I know that it wasn't just a dream. Mind you, this is just a few experiences, but this house, it made me believe in the paranormal. It made me believe that there are some things in this world that just cannot be explained yet. I don't know if the house is still there, but I do wonder sometimes and hope that the lost souls, if that's what they were in that house, that they found peace. So I started a new job a few months ago as a third shift technician in some older skyscrapers in my city. Before I was even hired, during my interview, I was asked by who is now my boss, do you have any aversions to ghosts or paranormal stuff? <laughs> I sort of chuckled and assumed that it was a joke, so I didn't answer immediately. After a few seconds, though, I realized that he was serious and double-checked. Oh, uh, actually, no, I I'm not averse to stuff like that, I said. He explained that third shift tends to see or hear things, but assured me that nobody has ever been harmed. I have always been a bit skeptical, I guess, of anything paranormal, enjoying and entertaining the ideas, but not fully believing due to a lack of evidence in my personal experience. After my onboarding and meeting my co-workers... I followed up on that line of thought though, sort of weighing if they believed in the paranormal prior to working here or not, what their experiences were, etc. Aside from one other newer guy, everyone has had experiences with stuff in the buildings apparently. 
I went through my training and was taught a lot about the history of the area and the buildings. A fun fact too, my office is two stories below the ground and about 10 feet below a graveyard that was relocated to make room for the tower maybe about 100 years ago. I'm sure that that's not important though, right? Anyway, I would say about two to two and a half months ago, I got off training and went to my normal shift working overnight. My co-worker has been on this shift for over a decade now and has an incredible insight into the details of these buildings. He explained that he's only ever seen stuff once, but it's fairly routine to hear shrill screams or to have your clothing and hair pulled even. The part that amuses me in hearing these accounts from my co-workers is that we're all blue collar workers most in their 50s and 60s, and with the most nonchalant matter-of-fact recounting of what they've seen. My co-worker took me through a tour of the building and showed me a spot on a floor of the building where, apparently six years prior, he was walking the floor as a part of an hourly fire watch and due to maintenance going on that floor that disabled the fire suppression system. As he disembarked the elevators and went north, a short lady, under five feet tall, he didn't recognize was coming down the hallway from the door that leads to the offices. At first, he jumped as we all do, right? Given these buildings are empty, except for us and security. And once he collected himself, he said hello, that he didn't recognize her and asked to see her employee badge, which is routine for us. She just let out a high-pitched, shrill sort of cackle. He sort of likened it to an old Hollywood witch's cackle and she walked away around the corner. On the other side of the floor, he bumped into maintenance guys and asked them if they had seen this lady and who she worked for. On the other side of the floor, he bumped into maintenance guys and asked them if they had seen this lady and who she worked for, but they hadn't seen her at all. After this fire watch round, he went and asked the security desk, but they said that nobody had come in or out aside from him and maintenance. And well, as for myself, I'm yet to see anything, but I can confirm now that I've definitely heard things. You see, a few weeks ago, I was repairing a, a sort of light fixture in a tunnel that we had under the buildings there. My coworker was with me, but due to his size and me being the new guy, I had the pleasure of climbing the 10-foot ladder to work on the fixtures. While wrapping up the last fixture, I felt a, a strong tugging on the fabric of my pants by my right knee. I asked my co-worker not to do that, as I don't have a great balance and don't want to eat the concrete. He didn't answer me though. I stepped down and turned around and he was at the other end of the tunnel, maybe 70 feet from me I would guess, kneeled down investigating a wire. Odd, but nothing extreme, right? Well, today, while I'm doing my routine, I heard a, a loud noise, sort of like tire screeching. I didn't think much of it. I mean, kids in their cars and all that, right? But it wasn't until a few minutes later that it dawned on me. I'm 40 feet below street level, under tons of metal and concrete. How on earth could I hear tires all the way down here? Well, a few minutes later, I was passing one of our entrances to the grillage, I think the roots of a skyscraper, and heard what I can only describe as a blood-curdling sharp scream come directly from the entrance. I concluded at that that, yep, I ain't messing with that today, and promptly just left off to the higher levels. So, what do you guys think about all of this? Any theories, questions... I'm really not sure what to make of it all, but in any case, it feels good to just share it with someone. I work as an EMT for an ambulance company. EMS has always been full of superstitions, and most of us believe in the supernatural on account of all the crazy gruesome stuff that we get to see on any given shift. Every company, every EMT, every firefighter has a, a story about the station that is haunted or something that happened to them that can only be explained as paranormal. For the company that I work at, 
We have about five stations, each with their own stories. Only one or two truly scary stories, but mostly things like employees seeing shadows out of the corner of their eyes, getting uneasy feelings in the stations, or hearing an unexplained knock or voice, or being hissed or growled at occasionally. And the station that I work at was no different. The station I work at is our main station, meaning that it is where we keep all of our extra resupply. So it is not uncommon for various crews to be going in and out of the station at all hours of the day. It was common knowledge too that the ambulance bay was pretty creepy at night. People report hearing noises, voices, footsteps or ambulance doors opening and closing out in our garage. Now, I've worked at this station for two years and I've definitely heard these things but it's always been an easy to dismiss sort of thing. I mean, it's just my partner doing something out of the bay or another crew doing some late night resupplies or something. The only experience that I've had there that I really couldn't explain was I heard distinctly growling noises in the garage late one night. At that time, I quickly realized that the only person in the bay was me and I certainly didn't growl at myself, so I quickly left. That was all I ever experienced there and for the most part felt very comfortable at that station. Well, that was until last night. So, the station is small and consists of a, a sort of living room with a kitchenette attached to a hallway. This hallway led to a garage on one side, the bathroom at the other, and at the end of the hallway is a door leading to the junior's bedroom, which you can then walk through to get to the senior's bedroom. If you go into the garage, there is a staircase that leads into the attack that stretches above the entire living quarters of the station. Me, Junior, and my partner, Senior, are dead asleep in our respective bedrooms. All the doors are closed, but when I'm awoken, I'm woken to all these loud banging noises and the wall shaking. I realize that this banging isn't just banging, though, but actually running. Something huge and heavy and fast is stomping and running around in the attack upstairs. It is stomping and running so loud that it is quite literally shaking the walls at this point. But whatever it was, it must have been absolutely huge to have been making sounds like this. But then, it gets faster. It is really fast and loud and it is running across the entire length of the attack now. It's moving faster than anything can move. The stomping is happening one right after another and it almost sounded like there were 10 people up there or a creature with too many legs running right above our head. It's so quick that it's just weird. I'm sitting upright in my bed now, huddled in the corner of the bedroom, absolutely horrified. I get this sort of deep visceral primal feeling of dread all of a sudden, almost like what prey must feel like when they're being hunted. And suddenly... It's as if a, a thought from somewhere else is placed into my mind and I just know with every fiber of my being that it knows that I'm awake and that I know that it's here. Like sick, twisted versions of that sort of Spider-Man spider sense theme. In between this stomping and the running though, I can hear this sort of barking, whirling sound. It's hard to describe, but it's sort of like a, a grunt mixed with the sound of wind almost. It is making this sound as it's running, whatever it is, and I realize that it is moving so fast that I can hear the wind that it's creating, sort of swooshing and whipping around it, and it's grunting as it's running. So now I very silently get up and I walk over to the senior bedroom door and try to open it, but it's locked. I feel as though I can't make a noise or it will come through into the station and kill me, I'm quietly knocking on the door, actually have some tears on my face now, pleading for my partner to let me in. I'm thinking that this is so loud that there's no way that she is asleep. But somehow, she is. She is out cold and I don't get a response. In the end too, I just decided that my partner had the right idea and I crept over to the junior bedroom door, separating my bedroom from the hallway that leads to the garage and the rest of the station and I just lock the door. So I silently creep back over to my corner in the bed with my blankets and I begin to text her. It's 1.45 and 
I'm begging her to wake up over text and describing what I'm hearing. She's not answering though, so I text her fiancé and ask him to call her and wake her up, but he's not answering either. It's at this point that I decide to text my mum, and as I'm sitting there I get a, a really similar feeling to before, just an intense dread, a stark realisation of pure truth. It doesn't even feel like my own thoughts to be honest, more like a, a piece of truth was just somehow slipped to me by the universe. What I think is that the thing upstairs, it is not human. I'm explaining to my mum what I'm hearing, all these loud swishing wind sort of sounds and stomping and running, and then I hear it run downstairs. When I tell you that my heart stopped and my soul left my body, when I heard coming down the stairs my stomach just completely dropped and I was nauseous. I genuinely thought that I was about to die. I was waiting for it to start pounding on the door and I had never been more thankful in my life because of the fact that I thought to lock that door earlier. I was waiting for screaming or the door to start shaking or something, but weirdly it just never came. It ran impossibly fast and hard back up the stairs, up the stairs, down the stairs, across the attack, down the attack, above my head in circles, down the stairs, up the stairs again and down again, and just kept doing this over and over and over again. So now, I'm absolutely hysterical on the phone with my mum. No one ever prepared me for dealing with being haunted and taunted by a demon or whatever it was. My mum is trying to calm me down and she asks me, what do you want me to do? To be honest, I didn't know. I don't know what she could have done. I don't know what to do. I just whisper, I don't know what to do, just please don't hang up. She tells me to bang on my partner's door and wake her up and so... At this point, I do. My partner wakes up and I hear rustling in her bedroom and she goes, yeah, in a sort of dismissive voice and slowly walks over to the door and opens it. I literally shoved her back in the room, whipped around faster than I ever moved in my life, closed the door and locked it. I explained to her everything that I was hearing and we go and sit on the bed. The activity is dying down now, but it is still active enough for her to hear the running upstairs too. It's 2.45 at this point. Another crew that gets off at 3 got to our station to put their truck away and clock out to go home. Me and my partner huddled together, glued to each other's hips, hurried outside together to meet with them out in the building parking lot. And it is at this point that we realize that a completely separate crew from around 11pm that night had only left our truck full of medical equipment and drugs unlocked in our parking lot in the area known for being a, a not so great area but also left our garage door open giving literally just anybody access to our entire station. Me and my partner are absolutely terrified and are not willing to go back into the station at this point. The crew that's getting off at three goes into the station to clock out and when they come back they see us hanging out in the truck. They joke with us for a minute over the ghost and sort of make fun of us for sleeping in the truck for the rest of the shift. We ask them if they heard anything, to which the senior on that crew, who has been there for a long time and staunchly believes in the supernatural, says, yeah, it definitely sounds like there is someone walking up there, but he's harmless. Me and my partner are just like, harmless? That thing is not harmless. They leave and we decide to call for PD to make sure that it wasn't some crackhead that had gotten in while the garage door had been left open. PD got there, searched everywhere very thoroughly, and found no one and no evidence of anyone even being there. It's four o'clock now and we notify our dispatch that station was cleared to be safe by PD and together we venture back inside. We elected to keep the truck in the parking lot so we would have to go back into the garage if we got a call or needed to make a quick escape from the demon or whatever it was. And together, we huddled together in the living room with all the lights on until we got off at seven. I heard a few minor bumps and bangs, but nothing crazy after that. Things that again could be dismissed as just house noises and whatnot. I barely slept though, and I am not looking forward to going back there later this week. In any case, eventually I do go back and there is a little bit of an update to this. It's nowhere near as crazy as what happened last time I was here, but 
There was some activity during the shift today that I figured that you guys might like to hear. Most of the shift was perfectly fine. We were busy and out of the station most of the day and a couple of times throughout the night too. While we were in the station though, there was some tension. The air was thick with our anxiety and I'm sure that this is what caused what I'm about to share. For some context too, out in the bay there is this sort of cage. It's literally just a large metal cage that runs along the back of the garage and is where we keep all of our resupply. The door to the cage is supposed to always be locked. This is to prevent crews from going in and messing up with the company inventory. The only people with keys to the cage are the supervisors, who don't come in until around 7. So, I was lying in bed, I was half awake, half asleep, just kind of staring at the ceiling, when I heard what sounded like the cage door being intensely rattled by something. It didn't sound like someone was trying to open the door, it sounded like someone grabbed a hold of the door and just started violently shaking it. This went on for about a minute. I went to my partner's bedroom to see if she'd heard it and found that she had slept right through it. We sat there for about 30 minutes listening for it, but there was nothing. It's 5.50 and I can hear distinct footsteps up in the attic now. Nothing crazy like the insane marathon running from the other day but quiet footsteps up there. My partner says that she can't hear them, so in the end, I just go back to my room. It's 6.30 now, and I can still hear an occasional footstep up there, and to be clear, no one goes up there because it's creepy, and there's really nothing up there at this point. It's just uh, some boxes and supplies and an extremely dark attic space. Because I was the only one hearing the footsteps, though, I decided to go out to the garage and investigate. When I get into the garage, the footsteps suddenly stop. There was no one in the garage, and when I went over to the cage to try and recreate the noise that I heard, I found that the door was open. Now, I'm not totally convinced that it wasn't just a person opening the cage door a bit aggressively. The only problem with this is that I have no idea who it would be because, as I said, there are only a few people who have a key to the cage and none of them are here and they don't get here for another few hours. I went back inside and I could again hear the footsteps upstairs and now what sounded like in the garage too. I tried to record the footsteps but they were too faint to pick up on the video. I also uh, want to point out that the crew that we met outside the other day that was making fun of us for hanging out in the truck had made comments about how he likes to do resupply and to slam the cage door, though I guess today that he just wanted to rattle the door or something. I'm not totally convinced that what happened today was a ghost and not just a person, but I'm also not totally convinced that it was a person and not a ghost. It is now 6.50 and I get off shift in about 10 minutes. I won't be back here for another 10 days and I wouldn't be lying if I said that I was sad about that. This story is from around maybe 5 or 6 years ago when I was a teenager but I still remember it very clearly. For some context, this was a wooded area near my hometown in the UK that had established bike paths and people visited regularly, making it a decently known area, but it was still pretty large and had areas that no one would really go to. It all began when my friend and I cycled to the area to do some jumps and generally just sort of ride about, when we spotted a swing on the top of a hill and we decided that we wanted to go up to see it and use it. We did so and spent around maybe an hour or two just talking and swinging and it began to get dark. My friend took off as he had to be back earlier than me and instead of leaving, I sort of cycled around for a bit longer. I ended up cycling pretty deep into the woods until I was no longer on bike paths and instead barely visible sort of dirt paths. I went up another pretty steep hill and this is when it happened. Below me maybe around 20 meters or so near the bottom of the hill, stood a man wearing a black leather gas mask, some kind of military-looking jacket, 
and holding a, a really long sort of thick torch in his hand. The torch? It wasn't on and he was just crouching down in my direction towards the hill, staring straight at the ground. And from what I could tell, he wasn't doing anything at all. But then he looked up at me. I couldn't make out if he was staring directly towards me, but the cold black voids of the mask's eye sockets really terrified me. I immediately nearly soiled myself and I leapt onto my bike. As I did, I heard a heavy and rough fast breathing getting louder and I rode as fast as I could for about 10 seconds before quickly looking back. He was stood still at the top of the hill, no longer chasing me, but just staring at me with the same cold black eyes. I never did tell anyone what happened, not even any of my friends, and still now, even driving past that place, it sends chills down my spine. I'm really glad that I had my bike with me that day because, to be quite honest, if I didn't, I think he probably would have caught me. And if he had, I shudder to think about what might have happened. I'm sitting in bed with a flashlight on at the moment, writing this at midnight because I'm just too scared to go back to bed. Let me preface this by saying that I live in a house that had been poorly abused before we moved in. I don't ever want to shame anyone, but... They were really odd, possible addicts. There was freaky graffiti on the walls and a set of rules for the wife that was left unfinished, not to mention the holes, burns and children's toys stuffed in the vents. We remodeled a lot of it though, but it'll never feel clean in this house again, I think. When we first moved in, I just felt the most overwhelming sense of dread standing in the room that was very obviously a child's bedroom at some point before seriously just bad vibes i don't think anyone has died in there though but still for the first few months i was constantly waking up in the middle of the night and one night my glasses were thrown clear across the room at some point another night every single figurine on my nightstand had been laid face down i've woken up with bumps and bruises but never anything too serious plus it all happened at night while i was asleep so I never put too much into it. My parents don't believe in spirituality, so there's no way that they would let me smudge the place or anything like that. But they would always just tell me to get over it. But for the past few months or so, right as I'm about to fall asleep, I hear or feel something walking up to the side of my bed and trying to tug my blankets off of my bed. I sleep face down with my blankets pulled tightly over for this exact reason. And last night... It was the strongest one that I'd ever felt, and I knew that it was coming before it happened. My face got hot and I just couldn't breathe. But something clamped down on my shoulder and started messing with my pillow right in front of me. I was terrified, obviously, but I've gotten to the point where I'm not too afraid to reach over and turn my lamp on. In fact, it brings me a bit of comfort, at least, to have the light on like that. When I did... Nothing was there and nothing has ever been there. I don't know if I'm hallucinating or if there's something wrong with me, but I want to clarify that I'm always 100% lucid in these moments. What I'm getting at is that it's not sleep paralysis or some weird sleep cycle stage or something. I, I don't know what it is, but has anyone else had this happen? And if you have... What did you do about it? I'm not a believer by any means, but I just had something really weird happen that I cannot explain. So I work from home. I was talking to my wife inside. I said, I'm going to go take a lunch break and mow the lawn. She said, okay, I'm going to go and take a shower. Fast forward 10 minutes, I'm mowing a patch of grass beneath our bedroom window, which is frosted over because it's in the shower looking out to the closed off backyard. I hear two raps on the glass and look up. There's a hand in the window waving at me behind the frosted glass. I assume my wife is in there showering, so I knock back. The hand waves in response and I wave at it. 
Maybe 30 seconds later, she comes out from around the corner, clothed, because she was apparently at the mailbox. She's been messing around in the house and she goes to the mailbox before getting into the shower, these days anyway. But this is my master bathroom that only my wife and I use. One kid's away at her friend's and the other was across the house in her room. I don't believe in ghosts and stuff like that, but I just do not have an explanation for what I just saw. So I live in a little farming community in Virginia. Nothing out here but cotton and peanuts and, well, apparently ghosts. I know that there was at least two in the store, but now apparently only one. Number one, he or she likes to knock things over, especially when we're talking about him or her. He or she also likes to appear as an orb in our security cameras from time to time. Number two, the one that I'm fairly sure isn't there anymore, was a kind of, I don't know, it's hard to find the word, but maybe like a spirit stuck in a cycle, so to speak. In any case, it was a dude in a black hoodie. Now, I could easily say that it was just a trick of my eyes, were it not for the fact that I saw him over and over again, or occasionally mistook him for a customer sometimes, or one of the two men that I work with. The first time that I realized that I was seeing something was when I saw this man walk from the coke window to the beer window. I thought that it was my co-worker, James, fronting the cooler windows, only for James to come in from outside as he had been walking the trash out to the dumpster. I got kind of a, a cold pit in my stomach when I realized that the person that I saw was technically not there. A few times I was shocked a, a customer had managed to get into the store without the doorbell ringing, saying hello as is required by the company, only to check the security cameras beside my register and realize that the floor was completely empty. So I began to be more cognizant of what I was seeing. The pattern sort of happens like this. The man starts at the sodas, walks to the single beer window, and disappears. I started talking to him, because I'm mouthy, and I said, you can't drink that beer anymore, man, you're dead. And look, I know, I know, you can think that I'm crazy if you want, but my other co-worker Sam has seen him too. I guess I saw him maybe about 15 to 20 times in total, but one day I saw him do something different. Instead of walking from the soda to the beer, he started at the beer window and started walking down the candy aisle toward the register and then disappeared. After that, I never saw him again. So personally, I hope that this means that whoever this guy was has finally found his way out of the store. I know it's probably weird to hear someone speak like this, as if ghosts are real, but for us guys here at the station, it was honestly just common knowledge. Whatever the case, rest in peace, my dead beer-drinking friend. Back in 2020, I was living with my ex and we lived in a terrible apartment. But later that year, he achieved his dream of being a homeowner and we began the process of moving into the house. But one night, he came home from work and decided that he was done with the apartment and we should pack what we had left and just move into the new house. So, we packed up our pets and the rest of our stuff and moved in and this is where it gets a little creepy. You see, it was probably about 9pm or so, and my ex was inside the house setting up the internet, and I went out to the trunk of the car to get some stuff when I heard a woman screaming and calling a name at first that I thought that she lost her dog or something, but as she got closer it sounded like a kid's name, also she was frantic and then she said the words come to mummy, and that's when it hit me that she had perhaps lost her kid. As she finally got into my view, I could see that she was a woman with blonde hair. She was carrying a lawn chair and she was crying and panicking at this point. I was making no attempt to conceal myself from the driveway and instead stared straight at her. 
I expected her to ask for help or something since her kid was lost apparently. And I mean, that's what I would do, but she didn't. She looked at me for a moment and kept walking down the street, still crying and calling his name. I ran inside and told my boyfriend what happened. Apparently, he could hear from all the way inside, and he called the police. The cops, they wasted no time in getting there, but still, she walked pretty quickly, and by the time that we saw the cop car, we didn't hear her anymore. I still don't know what happened after that as it was a strange welcoming to our new home and it never did happen again. I'm still not sure if she really was missing a kid or I don't know, maybe she was just crazy or something. But her panic seemed so genuine. What really creeps me out though is how she didn't ask for help and just walked past me like I wasn't there. I mean, if you lost your kid... Wouldn't you be asking someone to call the police at least? Something seemed really fishy about the whole situation. I do wish that I knew what happened. Hopefully she got her kid back though, or at least got the help that she needed. So this is about a kid that I went to school with. I'd known him since middle school and... He'd always been a bit weird, but when high school started, things just got worse. In middle school, he was just kind of cringe, I guess. Like stereotypical internet cringe sort of thing. You know what I mean? But by high school, he became genuinely horrifying. I have a lot of mini stories about him, but I'm going to be focusing on one for this. It's not that long, but bear with me. And for the sake of this, I'll call him Jay. This story took place in my freshman year. So every year at my school, before a new year starts, we have this back to school bash, which is just the kickoff football game with a chill little after party on the cafeteria patio where we all dance and drink soda and stuff. Pretty standard school organized party. My friends and I were having a, a pretty good time. We were sitting on a wall just drinking like Fanta or something, I think. I don't remember. But this kid, Jay, for whatever reason, thought that he was friends with me and my friends. I don't know why, but when I tell you that he trailed us at this party, I mean it. At one point, he came up to my group as well. We saw him coming and all exchanged sort of annoyed and simultaneous terrified glances. He came over to me and my best friend looked at us, paused for a minute, and then asked us, I'm trying to get girls to come with me into the woods. Do you have anyone you'd recommend? My friend and I just sort of froze at this. We were too shocked by what he had said to even respond. I mean, who asks that, right? Who says things like that? And what were his plans? I guess we'll never really know, but... He never got anyone, thank God. As my friends and I dedicated the rest of the night to telling all the adults what he had said, eventually I'm pretty sure that he got kicked out and had to have his mum pick him up. Again, thank God for that. Last I heard, he was still being very creepy and also drawing hate symbols on the walls of his new school. And that is a really ominous sign of something a lot worse that I really hope does not happen. So I'm 37 male from Ireland and my wife is 35 female from Texas. I have an interest in horror movies and scary stories, I'll admit, but I've always been a, a skeptic in reality, I guess. My wife had told me about experiencing paranormal encounters in her family home, which I just shrugged off as I've slept in buildings and castles a thousand years old and always experienced nothing. So how could she experience such things in a, a 50-year-old home in America? Excuse my arrogant Europeanisms. I was wrong. I assumed that she was just overly superstitious, as she is Hispanic, which, like the Irish, have a rich culture history of everything considered paranormal, ghosts, witches, demons, etc. But on the night in question, I'm in San Antonio, Texas, visiting my wife's family, 
I'm awake, laying on her bed, just staring through a doorway that leads to the living room area. It belongs to my wife. Her bedroom is like a sort of mini apartment. It's dark and around four in the morning when I see a, a sort of jet black cloud float along the floor in the living room. When I say black, I mean absolutely black, almost like a, a bad Photoshop on a photograph. So here I am looking at this cloud as it suddenly starts to stretch from its right side into a sort of triangle shape until it couldn't stretch anymore it seemed and snapped back into itself and evaporates leaving a head staring at me from the floor. The head is also jet black and is only visible from the neck up on the floor. I couldn't see its face but... I will always remember seeing the window light shining through its long curly hair. Obviously, I am in disbelief at this. I wake my wife as I'm still making eye contact with the head on this floor. I must have seen it for 15 seconds straight. Before my wife looks up, I turn on the flashlight on my phone in the head's direction and it just disappeared. After the event, my wife told me that she used to sleep with a blanket wall stacked on the bed covering the view of the doorway that I was looking through. She said that she used to do it because she was afraid that she would always see something. She's experienced noises and heard the voices of people talking, yet never seen anything. But when we told her family, her mother and auntie said that they have seen super fast glimpses of a black head looking around the doorway of the kitchen and the dining room. I wasn't aware of this beforehand, so my description of the black head really dropped some jaws at the dinner table. Amazingly, I was not frightened. I was just absolutely shocked, to be honest, and almost thrilled that I now fully believe in ghosts and even the afterlife. I still don't believe in organized religion, but... At least now I believe in something, right? I can't find information online regarding black shape-shifting cloud entities, but the cloud itself was blacker than black, with a sort of sharp rotating edge, almost like it contained a, I don't know, like a, a cyclone or a black hole, but it was so dark that you really couldn't see any definition inside of it almost. And I guess I'm wondering if anyone has experienced something similar or if you have any ideas as to what I saw that night. There was a, a time in my childhood where a lot of strange things happened to me. During that time, I used to have nightmares every night. Some of them were so disturbing that I woke up sweating and with my heart racing. One night when I was sleeping, I woke up because I felt a, a hand tickling me on my neck. The hand was cold and it tickled my neck very quickly and hard, so when I woke up, I still had the sensation in my neck skin. I thought that maybe it was just a dream and so in the end I went back to sleep, but it didn't go away. The tickling started happening every night and during the day sometimes I would ask my family if it was them pranking me, but... None of them took me seriously, so it definitely wasn't them. A couple of days passed, and one night I realized that I had left my jacket at my neighbor's house, which was across a little park in front of my house. It was dark outside, but I didn't feel scared to go because it was like five minutes away, so I decided to go as quickly as I could. Everything was going all right until I started crossing the park, when suddenly I I felt very uneasy. The place was extremely quiet and lonely, but I just felt like something dangerous was watching me. And that's when it happened. I heard what I can only describe as a, a deep, long moan come from between the bushes, something like a, a sound a zombie would make. I turned around and looked into the bushes, and I will never forget what I saw. It was a tall, completely red man. He looked like he was covered in almost like bright red blood. I started screaming and I ran to my neighbor's house. They let me in and gave me a glass of water to calm me down. My heart was about to come out through my throat and I was shaking so hard that it took me a while to calm down and tell them what happened. 
After that, they took me home and I told my family about what had happened and they just told me that I must have imagined it. I couldn't cross that park anymore from the fear that I felt from just looking at it. I had to cross it a few times after that happened and I heard the noise again, just heard the noise this time. I never saw the man again, but no one ever seemed to hear it like I did, just me. One day though, it just stopped happening all of a sudden, as well as the tickling and the nightmares. I still don't know if it was all just my imagination or not, but it was all pretty real to me at the time. That was clear. My mother lives in an apartment complex on the edge of the city, right where Parkersburg, West Virginia turns into Mineral Wells, West Virginia. The apartment complex is really on a dead end, but it's not quite near the dead end part. When I was living with her, I used to park my car on this concrete slab that was by the sign to the entrance, because I could pick up Wi-Fi from this person's house. I'm usually a bit of a night owl, so this must have been at around maybe 2 in the morning. I had been sitting in my car for about an hour on my phone, and at this point, I just kept feeling like I was seeing something, like a shadow in my passenger side mirror, and I couldn't shake the feeling like I was being watched. I will say that I had always got a weird vibe from the woods around here. Even walking down the road was frightening for me because I always felt this overwhelming anxiety. Sometimes it would be so bad that when I was walking, once I made it to by the sign to the entrance, I would always take off running until I just made it near the office to the apartment complex. But after I kept seeing a shadow from the mirror, I decided that I was going to turn my headlights on because since I was on my phone, my eyes weren't acclimated to the darkness. So once I put my phone down, I couldn't really see. I turned my headlights on though and... All I can say is that there was this tall thing standing near the edge of the woods and it starts slowly backing up into the woods. At this point, I hurried up and I started my car and I took off like nobody's business. I drove to the gas station and I just sat there and realized that there must have been at least two of these things because I know that there was something around my car watching me. Whatever it was, it was tall and I remember it looking grey. I can't really remember the face and I mean, it was a, a fair distance away so my view wasn't really great. But I was so scared once I saw it that I just took off as quickly as I could and I really didn't have time to focus on the face. To this day, I don't ever walk down that road when it's dark, especially if I'm by myself. There's also been a couple of times when I would walk from my friend's house who lived a couple of miles from my mum's and it was on this country road. There's a certain part of that walk where I just get this sensation that I need to walk a lot faster because something is in the woods around the area and it just doesn't want me near there. I really don't know how to explain it but it's just this feeling like something was really angry that I was there and wanted me gone as quickly as possible. I don't know, maybe it is just my mind playing tricks on me or maybe there's some kind of ability that I have that I can't quite figure out yet. And well, if anyone has any suggestions to what I saw or have any suggestions about the feelings that I get near a certain area of the woods a, a few miles up from the road here, then do let me know because I'm just a bit stumped by all of this. This happened about 10 years ago. I must have been 27 and I'm female. So my partner at the time was in a band and we stayed in this converted garage. Not really converted, I guess. It was still very much like a garage. Concrete walls, damp, but we may do. It was in a, a service lane. It's sort of like a street that has a business down in it and the back of the houses and whatnot. We had come home very early that morning and gone to bed. His bandmate was living in a bus at the time which was parked out the front as they stored the gear next to our flat in another garage. I woke up at around 5am hearing screams, mainly from a woman but 
Also very aggressive shouting from a man, I'm going to kill you and so on. The area that we were in is not the nicest by any means. Although now the area is very hot property. It's not far from the beach, boutique shops, etc. But this was coming from a house that I had thought was condemned. Two stories, dilapidated, torn curtains, rotten wood. About five broken down cars out the front that had been picked apart. And it turns out that someone was living in there. I woke up and went straight to the front door and saw a man stomping around a parked car on the side of the road, chasing a lady in her pajamas around it, threatening to kill her. She was screaming and crying and out of instinct, I screamed out something like, hey, what are you doing? I'm calling the cops. They both stopped and looked at me in my pajamas, standing near my door barefoot. The man, he had a full leather jacket, pants and boots, half a face tattoo, and even though he was across the street, I could see the whites of his eyes. He was obviously on something and absolutely furious. He shouted at me, I'm going to kill you, and motioned cutting of the throat with his thumb. When he turned to me, the woman escaped to the abandoned looking house and locked the door. I, being brave and stupid, replied, come on then, and grabbed a large plank of 2 by 4 I kept it behind the door there as I found this area rather sketchy and would be home alone a lot on the weekends. I've never used it, but I felt better having it there. And walked outside in my pajamas and leopard print robe with the wood over my shoulder on the phone to the police. Now, I'm not the smallest woman in the world. I must have been around 80 kilos at that point, 5'10", but he would have taken me out if he wanted but I think the idea of the police made him second guess. He got the hint and he took off down the road. My partner nor the other bandmate in the bus got up at any point. I must admit that I was pretty angry at both of them. I seemed to be the only one who had the, the kahunas to do anything about it. Another lady across the road came out also and we talked about our menfolk not doing anything about it. Her husband stayed in bed too. And anyway... Later on that week, a lady came to my house thanking me for helping her niece, that he was some crazy cracked out guy that had fallen in love with her and wouldn't take no for an answer apparently. He had apparently come to her house without invitation, expecting that she would welcome him drunk and cracked out of his mind with open arms, only to be rejected, which is allegedly what threw him into a rage, to which he proceeded to kick and beat her and chase her around the street. Later on, maybe about a week later, I was told that he was arrested and taken away on my street. He was led away by police handcuffed with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. And I was glad to hear it as I was terrified that he was going to come back when I was alone. So I live in an apartment with my family in Morocco and I'm in a period where I need to focus for my final exams. Today, as usual, I'm sick and so I didn't go to school. I use this free time to practice more for the upcoming tests and at approximately, I would guess 8pm, my father called me and suggested that I should go for a car ride in order to spend some time with him. My parents are divorced, so when I'm with my mother, I see him less often than I do my mum. Anyway, I was with my father for like 30 minutes, and it was really nice. We arrived in the front of the building where I live with my mum. I said goodbye to him, and I went towards the building. I pushed the button of the intercom so that my mum would open the door, and then I saw a food deliverer with his motorcycle parked just next to me. He comes... So here he comes, which is obviously not a problem. I thought that he was going to deliver something to a neighbor. Nothing unusual here, but I don't know. There was just something off. Firstly, usually deliverers in Morocco, I don't know if this is the case in other countries, but certainly is here, have like a box where they store the food in order to keep it warm. But this guy, he didn't have one. He was just holding the bag with the food in his hand while riding the motorcycle. Also, he opened his phone like as if he was going to check a delivering app, 
but as I said, he didn't have the box or the logo of a delivering service anywhere on him. So even if my mother did unlock the door, I preferred not to open it and talk to this guy. I order from restaurants and fast food a lot, and I'm used to seeing deliverers and even talk a little bit with them from time to time to try and make them laugh and get to know them a bit. I know it's a hard job because of the people being jerks, so I don't know, I just try to be as friendly as I can. So I start saying hi to this guy, how are you bro, in Moroccan, and the guy was pretty nice. He had a great smile and a nice way of talking, but he took time before answering me like he was sort of, I don't know, like lagging or something. But it's okay, it happens. Maybe he was stressed or preoccupied, so nothing to worry about. I asked him what door number is it, and he replied, 42, which is odd because the last door of the building is like the 14th, I think. So I told him to check the app, and then I tried to watch his phone, even though I'm not next to him, and instead of opening a delivering app, he opened WhatsApp and didn't even open a chat. Then he said, oh, uh, door 11. And at this moment, I knew something was wrong because I live at the 12th door and so 11th door is right next to me and I'm sure that my neighbors weren't the ones to order because they were on a trip. So at this point, I got a little bit stressed and I told him that it must be an error because of the reason that I just told you guys, but he insisted to go in and told me that he's used to deliver at this address and that he knows where he needs to go and he also tells me that the customer knows him and that he asked him to be quick because he liked his food to be as hot as possible. I said to this guy that I couldn't just let him enter the building but that I was going to check if the guys of the 11th floor were back from their trip and if so I was going to let them know that he was here. I also told him that the guard of the building was usually in the cafe next by and that he could go and talk to him if he wanted. I also lied to him and told him that my dad was waiting for me and that I just needed to go to the WC for a sec. He was angry at first, but he immediately changed his attitude and became sort of friendly again. I asked him to step aside and then I asked again my mum to unlock the door and enter it. I was still nervous and while I was walking towards the elevator, I got really scared all of a sudden because I noticed that I didn't hear the door close behind me. I felt numb because I could have closed it myself, but at this moment, I was sure that he had entered the building. I immediately started running towards the staircase and at the same time, he tried to throw the bag that he was holding at me. I don't know why, but he missed. At this moment, I'm thinking really quickly. I also have Crohn's disease, which in short is a disease that causes inflammation of the intestines and a lot of pain, but according to my doctor, it also explains why I'm an anxious person and why I usually think too much. And so, I already thought in the past of a scenario where I needed to hide from something in the building. I know, it's weird, but I've come to the conclusion that the underground parking garage is the best place, because it's really large due to the fact that it was shared by four buildings. So, I run as quickly as I can towards that staircase, and I immediately start going downstairs. Now, before I continue, I need to state that I'm a pretty tall guy. I'm like 6'3", and so it's difficult for me to hide quickly. I run, and I hear him chasing me, and at this moment, I remember that the other buildings have their own doors in the parking lot, so I run towards one of them. I see someone from afar and start screaming, a call and the caretaker of the building's name, quickly, but he didn't react and then enter one of the doors. I go upstairs, open the door of the building and enter the bakery just next to it. Luckily, uh, I find the caretaker or the concierge, I don't know, I'm really not sure how to say it in English, and explain to him really quickly what's happening. He immediately got out of the bakery and started chasing this guy, but... He was too far away and was running towards his motorcycle, so we couldn't catch him. I was tired of all of that running, but strangely, I wasn't really in shock or anything. And still, while sharing this, I feel a little bit, I don't know, maybe excited about what happened or something. Am I weird? 
I'm definitely not going to tell my parents because they'll forbid me to go out alone or take a taxi ever again. I tried to look out for the bag that he tried to throw at me, but it wasn't there anymore. And, and look, I know that I'm selfish for not calling the police and preferring not to worry about it. But honestly, they wouldn't do anything anyways. In the end, I don't know what that was all about. I have some suspicions that maybe it was a kidnapping attempt or something like that. All I know is that I'm glad that whoever that guy was, he didn't catch me. I used to work the docks of a, a salmon cannery in the middle of nowhere, Alaska, 16 hours a day, 7 days a week, no days off from May until August. It was a really cool job if I'm being honest, but lots of uh, seedy characters. Seasonal work in remote places seems to attract people who don't really fit in with normal society, I guess. Or people who well, want to get away from something, maybe. Gary, he was one of those people. He had worked at another place in town that was owned by the same parent company, and in the lead up to the fishing season, he was lent to us for some carpentry tasks. Gary was probably in his uh, 40s or 50s, grey hair, weird delivery in his speech, not like a, a speech disorder, just like weird I guess is the best way to explain it, but like he was smiling inside about something grotesque while he spoke. When he first got to our camp he was telling me the HR stuff kept asking him all these personal questions, I asked what kind of questions and he responded that they wanted his full name and phone number. He told them that he didn't feel comfortable with that and would be willing to work for a reduced rate if he could just keep the information to himself. Obviously, that was a huge red flag. One day though, I'm working with a co-worker on a, a little welding project when Gary pops out of a doorway. He goes, hey, you guys want some meat? We've been eating cafeteria food for weeks at this point and working hard enough that we always maintained a caloric deficit. You don't say no to good food, right? He cut us each off a slice, and it was a smoked something. Now, here's some personal info on me. My family is Eastern European. I was born in New York City and then spent half of my childhood in NC. I've been eating smoked meats of uh, every variety all my life, pretty much. It's a piece of my culture, basically. But I don't know what the heck this was. It was almost pork, I guess, but it wasn't pork. Gary goes, you guys like that? To which we respond sheepishly, uh, yeah, thanks Gary. Gary literally laughs at this, like slowly and creepily, and then just leaves. Now, me and this guy that I'm working with look at each other and sort of laugh it off and say, well, we must have just eaten Gary's wife or something dark vibes. I love my job. Anyway, later that night, I'm in the cafeteria alone eating a bagel. Gary walks in. Hey man, you liked the meat earlier? Yeah Gary, it was good. I respond. Gary goes, that's funny man. And then just sort of laughs softly. I don't know. I'm pretty sure that I ate a slice of Gary's wife that day. I uh, haven't told this story much and it still creeps me out to this day. See, when I was 12 years old in about 2013, I moved to this old house built in about the 1940s. No one has lived in this house for over 30 years and it was the first fall that I'd seen at this house. I was taking trash out to our back porch and from there I could see a tree line that's normally very green and hard to see through but seeing how it's fall, the leaves are almost all fallen. And as I walk out to take the trash out, I look at the tree line. About 30 to 40 yards away, I see four or five of at least seven foot tall, like pure white humanoid and no-faced creatures. I stand there in awe, not knowing what to think. It honestly looks like they're sort of talking with hand gestures or something, but... I couldn't hear anything, obviously. Now that I think of it too, I 
really heard nothing at the time. No birds, bugs, or even the trees moving with the visibly moving branches. I screamed, hey, to which the creatures became sort of motionless like a statue. Then I proceeded to ask, who are you? To which I stand there for a second before the creatures dispersed. Now I could see far into the woods and they all went their separate way, not even hearing a leaf or a twig crack when they fled. But they ran off so quickly that it almost seemed like a blur as well. To be honest, after that, I sort of completely forgot about the experience until later that night, which I know is really weird. As I said though, I was young and at this time my mum worked night shift and wasn't there for when I screamed at these creatures. For your interest too, I lived on essentially a farmland, but my neighbours could easily walk up my driveway in a matter of like two or three minutes. So, later that night, around 9pm, I heard knocking on my back door, the one where it leads to the back porch where the creatures were, and I thought that maybe my mum told the neighbours to check up on me or something, so I go to check it out. I go to the back door, turn the back porch light on and open it to where nobody was there. Casually, I sort of chopped it up to maybe one of my dogs hitting the door or something around like that. Now, after this, knocking kept coming from the door and it was weird because every time that I rounded a door to where I could see the back door, the knocking just stopped. This happened a few more times every few minutes as well, ranging from when I turn my back from the door to when the moment that I sit back on my bed to just waiting five or ten minutes before it happened again. After about an hour of this, I think, and increasing anxiety, I got fed up and I went outside to scream, I don't know who you are, but you better stop. And to my surprise, it did. For about 30 minutes, that is. Then the knocking came around the house, on the windows, the doors, the walls from the outside for about another 30 minutes. I was scared, curled up in the corner of my bed. After the 30 minutes, there was one last bang beside my window that I felt like sort of shook the house a bit and was shocked the window didn't break in fact. And that was the end of it. There was really nothing for the rest of the five years that I lived there. The shocking part though was that the outside was old, as stated, and could honestly be broken with one good swing to the exterior. But where that final bang was, there was no sign of any impact. Honestly, I think that's what scared me the most too. That this creature could full force shock my house and leave like no damage whatsoever. I lived in Tennessee by the way, if this maybe helps figure out what this thing is. Side note too is that I have some friend stories with these creatures if anyone wants to know about them but... For now, this will have to do. Me and my roommate moved into this place about 10 months ago. The landlord who lives above us told us that this place is haunted. Our landlord is 80 years old and apparently channels. She says that she channels her higher self as well as living people. People who passed on and ashed her or something. And I'm like, okay, that's cool, sure. But when we looked at the house, we saw the sauna. It has like an old wooden door, but after we moved in, handprints appeared on the door, and they looked like they were sort of dragging down, I guess. I mean, that could have been anything, right? But fast forward a little bit, and I'm in the bathroom. My roommate downstairs is in his room. I hear footsteps coming up the stairs, and I wait to see if he pops up, and no... I call him over Facebook and ask, are you upstairs? But I can hear him downstairs in the room. He says, no, I'm in bed. Why? I explain that I heard footsteps. I go down to his room. Later, he needs to use the bathroom. And the same thing happens to him. He hears footsteps and nobody's there. We stayed in the same room that night. And the next thing that happened was just super creepy. You see, me and my roommate were sitting in his bedroom watching some videos and drawing. He has this old music snow globe that he has on his dresser. 
The video that we had playing was a gameplay video and it had music box music for the background sound. But we thought the sound was a little bit odd so we paused it, put the video back 10 seconds and played it again. We then realized that it was the snow globe that was actually playing. We could hardly believe it. A while later and we were in bed and in the middle of the night we both heard a bang. We didn't see what it was because, I mean, we just got out of there, but when we got up the next day, his silver the hedgehog pop figure was on the ground with his limbs, and I mean all four of them, ripped off. And there's just no way that that should have been possible. There was a hand on the sofa, two feet off the ground, a leg under a blanket, and two just on the floor. The GameCube that we have was also opened and the creepy thing was that the little clear stand pop figures that we have, all of them were unmoved, untouched, except for that pop figure. It was a, a really weird experience and for us, we just could never explain it. A month later, I used this filter on TikTok. It's supposed to catch ghosts or whatever. It has sort of like glowing eyes and would appear when it finds a face. And I always felt like something was watching me and so I started to film. I walked up the stairs to the main floor and something popped up at face level, looking like it was peeking around the corner. I got a bit freaked out by that, I admit, so I ran to my room. A week ago, our landlord was out for a family thing and we heard someone running up and down the hall at like 11pm at night. We heard banging and thumping and it sounded like somebody was dropping something. Our landlord is not the strongest and can't run or carry things so we found this out later that she definitely wasn't home and even if she was, there's just no way that she could have done this. Again, a few days ago I was downstairs trying to find some towels and my roommate is upstairs. He said, Rose, Rose, are you up there? I replied with no why and not even a minute later I hear something loudly whisper in my ear a pookie or something like that which is just a, a weird thing me and my roommate say to each other. I jumped out of my skin and looked to the door wondering if my roommate snuck up on me or something but he was upstairs still in the bathroom. Two days ago I cleaned the bedroom and all was good like I was proud of that room and yesterday we found a dead spider on the dresser. Today all the legs were ripped off and placed all around it. We just constantly feel like we're being watched and we always hear footsteps like I said. Have you ever felt something like this? Like someone is giving you a death glare that you can almost imagine them being there. You can sort of feel it I guess. But when you look around there's nobody there. That's how I feel a lot in this place. When we come home from work, we can sort of feel it as if something's looking at us through a window or something. We're moving soon and it's starting to get worse as well. We mentioned moving before the whisper in my ear and I don't know if it wants us to stay or go, but in any case, we're getting out of here as quickly as we can. A few years ago in the northern parts of Sweden, I'm going out for a, a nice evening of fishing. I am what I guess is a, a fisherman supervisor. I check that the other fishermen get their license at a certain area of the lakes and streams and whatnot. And anyway, this is in late summer and I've been doing my round which I usually end with going to a small lake and fly fishing for some trout. This lake or pond is pretty deep in the forest and I rarely meet anyone there. Actually, I've never really met someone there, I guess. This lake looks kind of like a crater, I guess you could say. A perfect round circle that's perhaps 100 meters in diameter. It contains a natural population of perch and trout. Anyway, it's a warm summer evening with a slight breeze. The birds are chirping and the fish is rising to all the insects spawning on the surface. I rig my gear and aim for one of the fish rising to the right of me. At the same second as my fly lands on the surface, it's like someone pauses time or something. 
the sun hides behind a cloud, the wind stops blowing, the birds are suddenly completely silent, and the fish stop eating too. All of a sudden, a, a smell rises from the ground that I'm standing on. It smells like something dead, something really rotten, like I have a carcass buried under my feet. All of a sudden, I'm aware that there's also something walking out of the forest behind me, maybe 10 to 15 meters behind me. It's like I can see it in the corner of my eye, but I still really can't see it. I know it's really hard to understand, but every hair in my body is on end, and it's suddenly very cold around me too. This thing watching me just stands there, and I don't have the courage to turn around at all. I see my fly sink to the bottom, but I can't move. I can't do anything about it because I don't dare move. Then the wind just hits me and it carries the awful smell away. The sun hits me again, a bird is singing somewhere in the forest and the almost overtaking feeling of being watched lets go of me. I turn around suddenly and there's nothing there. On the lake, the fish start rising again, and at that, I pack my gear, and I throw the backpack on my back, and I run for it, through the forest, all the way to my car. I hit the gas and drive like a maniac until I find the big road in civilization again. I park at the side of the road and say to myself, what the heck was that? My heart is still racing. I haven't visited this lake since this happened, and... I know I won't be. What do you guys think it was, though? I've probably visited this place 20 times before this happened and never felt anything like it. The only thing is that I'm always afraid of bears when I visit it. I do fish at a lot of ponds and lakes that are pretty deep in the forest, but nothing like this has ever happened. There's a lot of wildlife in these places, of course. Deers, moose, fox, and the occasional wolf, bobcat, and bear... I'm familiar with them, and this just wasn't that. I'm never afraid of meeting one except when I've been visiting this particular lake, and... Anyway, I apologize for my bad English. Like I said, I'm from Sweden, and it's not my first language, but... I hope you get the gist of it, and if you have any ideas of what this could have been, then I would really love to hear it. Thanks. So I like to look for new out of the way fishing holes. If I'm on a trip and have my gear, I'll pull up a map, look at the different connecting waterways and try to find back roads that may lead to spots that few people know about. On one trip, maybe about 10 years ago, I'm in Western PA and I'm looking for a road to connect me with this small and sort of out of the way stream that I found on the map. I'm in the country. It's not too desolate, but houses are definitely getting farther and farther apart and looking more and more, well, beat up, I guess. I surmise that I'm really close to where this stream is supposed to be, so I turn down a dirt road that leads toward a tree line in the direction that I believe this stream could be. The road starts out in okay shape, but as soon as I pass into the tree line, stuff gets really weird. It's mid-afternoon, but the canopy of trees is so thick that it suddenly looks like dusk. Then the road very quickly deteriorates, starts to close in and then starts to pretty much vanish I guess. There are banks on either side of me so I figure that I'm on some sort of old logging road that rarely if ever gets vehicles on it anymore. The road is getting worse and worse. Large rocks start appearing at random spots in the road, the first sort of sporadically and then more frequently. It's very unnatural looking. It looks like they were placed on purpose I guess but my car is a four wheel drive. I'm getting a little worried because the rocks are getting larger and combine this with the how tight the road now is and driving around them is becoming more and more sketchy. It's definitely becoming harder to get through this. I'm now driving very slow so as not to pop a tire or make a wrong move and get stuck on the bank or something. But the road suddenly takes a very sharp left hand turn and sort of downward as well. I creep along this turn but stop as I see the road continuing this weird downward trajectory. At this moment, my gut starts talking to me and telling me to turn around, but it's at this point that I realize that I can't. 
the road is just not wide enough to do a three-point turn. I could chance it, but I didn't want to get my front end caught on something pushing over the bank or my back end going off the back in the other direction and getting stuck. So I say to myself, keep pushing forward and you are bound to get to just enough room to turn around shortly. As I make my way driving this weird downward road with sharp curves and oddly placed rocks, I start to see items off to the side of the road. At first, it's just garbage. Bottles, boxes, wrappers, etc. Then I start seeing toys. Kids toys. And lots of them. Like an uncomfortable amount. Then I start seeing clothes. Some look old and weathered like they'd been there for years and some look fairly new. The amount of clothes that I'm seeing also increases. Then I start seeing mattresses. Not one mattress, but lots of them all over the place that they're dirty and there's heaps of dark stains on them and it's at this point that my gut is now screaming at me to get out of here but I still don't have room to turn around while I'm sitting there and trying to figure out my next move I suddenly get the distinct feeling that I'm being watched from somewhere the moment that that feeling hits me I audibly yell at myself nope then I slam the car in reverse and drive reverse, dodging all of the random rocks and all the way back up and out the sharp turns until the path levels out again. I go full on get the heck out of here mode and risk making the three point turn as well. My back end goes slightly off the bank and I slam back into drive and pound the gas to throw myself back onto the road and out of whatever dark woods horror movie that I just discovered. I still have no clue what I happened to come across that day. Best case scenario was probably some deep woods meth den. All I know is that ever since then, no matter what I'm doing, the moment that my gut starts telling me to get out, I listen to it. When I was 12, I lived in a town called Stuber. I lived in a house with my mum and my older brother at the time, who wasn't home for most of this, but one night I was up late, probably around four in the morning, when I suddenly heard what sounded like somebody standing next to me and just sort of breathing. Almost spot on the sound that you'd hear if somebody inhaled through their nose and then exhaled from their mouth. I got up to try and pinpoint where it was coming from, and every time I, I thought that I was coming closer to it, it would move and suddenly it would be behind me or in another corner of the kitchen or something. Once I realized that, I went straight up to my room until sunrise, which was just above the kitchen. When the sun came up, I went down and my mum was awake and went to her and told her I wanted to tell her about something and she said that she wanted to tell me about something too. So I went first and told her what I had heard and her response was that... She was about to tell me the same thing. That she had been getting up early some mornings and sitting in the kitchen on the computer and hearing this breathing sound. After that, this thing came around for a good two weeks or so, every night, in the middle of the night. Until one time, I finally broke down and screamed at it to leave us alone and it just immediately stopped and never returned after that. Another time I was laying in my bed on my phone and talking to my friend in another town when my mattress just started shaking violently. It wasn't an earthquake or anything like that because it was only the mattress that shook. It felt exactly like as if someone had walked up to it, grabbed it and just started shaking it like crazy. Whenever family members would visit this house, they would always think that they saw someone going up the stairs. One night... I slept in our living room by myself with nothing on and distinctly heard someone whisper my name to me. A lot of other things have happened while living there too, including weird stuff outside. I'm in my 30s now and I've never been able to come up with a satisfying explanation as to what could have been making that breathing sound, or how it could also be able to move around like that and reacted to me yelling at it. I guess why I'm sharing this too is that I'm wondering... Has anyone else had an experience like this? The 
This story takes place five years ago. At the time I was 14 and I was a boy scout since I was about 11. It was on a summer holiday and we were usually two weeks in the wild just doing scout stuff. We get to know other scout groups from the other parts of the country too. It's generally a really good time to meet new people. This time, we met with three other groups and we would spend three weeks together. For the record, I was with the two other guys of my group and we shared a tent together. So, the days go on and one of my friends has a crush on this girl. But one day he invites her to our tent on the evening to have some fun playing cards and tell jokes and she agreed. And on that evening, she snuck up to our tent and came with a few friends of hers. Her name was Mia. We had a good time during the night and a couple of hours later they both left. During the time at the camp, a good friend of mine, Lisa, had a crush on Mia who was also into her and it was a really happy moment for everyone really. The days go on and Mia gets uh, a little bit weird I guess and talks alone to people who aren't in the camp. As time goes on, rumors start spreading that Mia apparently tried to end her life in a forest or something. Apparently a kid saw her trying to do something and after that they alerted the adults and she was going to get picked up by her parents a couple of days later. She was gone for a couple of days and everything pretty much went back to normal. Little did we know though that Mia was back in the camp as other younglings saw her in the forest saying things in the likes of I want to see Elisa while holding a knife. At that moment... Everybody was scared. The adults decided to dress up a big tent and put us all inside whilst we waited for Mia to show up. Eventually, she did show up too, saw us, and ran straight towards us with knife in hand. It happened so quickly, but I remember it. One of the adults managed to tackle her down and made sure that she wouldn't get up by holding her tight. Another adult made sure to pick her knife up and called for the police and her parents. When the police showed up, they took Mia, followed by her parents, and it was the last time that I saw her. Since then, I only ever really heard from her once more. I heard that she was diagnosed with schizophrenia or something like that, and she's in a clinic with people there to help her. Lisa is obviously still traumatized by all of these events, but one thing that really bums her out is that her name is one letter apart from Mia's. People sometimes mispronounce it and it always makes her recall these events. Anyway, obviously Mia and Lisa aren't the real names of the girls, but you get the drift. It was a stressful time for everyone and it's something that I'll never forget. I was in juvie as a kid pretty often. I ended up doing four months out of the six month sentence for possession with intent to distribute and probation violation which was the longest that I'd gone to the juvie. Ghost stories have been shared amongst the kids in there fairly often. The DOs, detention officers, would chime in time to time to tell theirs as well. Some were pretty hard to buy because it's juvenile and there isn't much to do besides tell stories, especially when talking through vents and toilets. But one night, it was time for lockdown, bedtime, so we all turned in our stuff and headed in our cells. This time of night, someone is usually talking to you through a vent, so we'd stay up a little bit after lockdown, unless you were tired. Sometimes, we'd just mess around and even holler out the cell door saying insults to one another or egging on the DOs to come into the pod just to annoy them. And this night, we honestly thought that someone was just messing around again because we hear what sounds like wailing, like someone pretending to be in pain echoing through a cell door and so a lot of the kids were yelling for them to shut up and banging on the cell doors to get them to stop. A lot of threats were thrown out towards whoever was making the noise. But then, the wailing sounded like someone was actually in pain, guttural moaning and groaning, sounds you would hear from someone dying perhaps, absolutely terrifying to hear. I started to get chills down my back because it sounded unreal. 
Finally though, the DOs came in and turned on the lights and started calling out for whoever it was seeing as someone sounded like they needed medical assistance. They opened all of the doors and told us all to step out so they could figure out who needs help. But the sound kept going, even after we all stepped out and lined up downstairs. The sound seemed to be coming from the second level, from a cell that no one was inside of. Two DOs went up and opened the door and the wailing kept going. The DOs radioed it in saying that there's nobody in the cell and that they were openly talking about how creeped out they were. And then a DO rushed down the stairs and told another DO we all needed to leave the pot. We grabbed our blankets and moved to the pot across the way. All the while this wailing was continuing. It was genuinely like something out of a horror movie. Now, while we were waiting in the other pod for new cells to be assigned, the lights in the pod that we were in had started to flicker. The look of horror on the kids' faces and the faces of the DOs sent goosebumps over my entire body as we were all witnessing this. One DO even told us that we needed to pray, so we all grabbed hands and began praying. Kids that hated each other were grabbing hands and praying. That's how wild this was. Eventually, we were all sent into our new cells and down for the night. The next morning, we were telling all the kids in the new pod about what happened, and they were really shook. One D.O. had told us him and the other D.O.s had seen a, a black-figured cloak floating around in the pod around midnight, stopping at different cells. We never got moved back into that pod the rest of the time that we were there. I saw that they ended up making it a rec room for the blue shirts, the kids with more privileges because of good behavior, the last time that I was around there anyway. So this morning I was uh, napping on my couch when I heard my dog start barking and growling at my patio door. I got up and peeked around the curtain to see what got them riled up like this. And when I did, I saw three kids in my driveway. One older boy looked to be around maybe 13 or 14. A younger boy, maybe around 10. And a younger girl looked to be around maybe 7 years old. They were all blonde and pale. I was obviously creeped out by this, but I ignored it. And I went back to lay down, hoping that they would just go away. I mean, they're just kids after all. But a few minutes later, I heard a noise at my front door. So I peeked around the corner and saw the little girl looking in my window. And her eyes were completely black. Like, there was no color in them whatsoever. Even when the whites should be, they were completely dark. Obviously, I didn't answer the door and I just sort of hid in my living room until eventually they seemed to leave. Now, I don't want to say that I'm entirely sure that this absolutely happened because I do tend to have very vivid dreams when I take my morning nap. But this time, it felt really real and I was walking around, I'm sure of it. I truly hope that it was just some weird dream or something, but anyway, I just wanted to share this and get your thoughts. I was a 16 year old girl and an avid runner. I ran anywhere from 4 to 10 miles a day. I had a few parks that I rotated through and decided one day after school and before work to run at this pretty secluded park next to the river. It was a really hot day and I knew this park had a lot of shade so I thought that that would be really good. Now I usually carried a knife or pepper spray with me but forgot it at home this time and didn't really have time to go back home before work. Coming in, I noticed a few mums with their kids at the playground and what I believe to be one of the children's grandpas watching the kids play. I love kids, so I always enjoy seeing them. Cut to me running my laps though and it was getting closer to dinner time and the families all started to slowly leave. This park was two laps per mile, so I was on the second half of mile three when I noticed all of the mums and the kids were just all of a sudden gone. I was a little bit uncomfortable since I believed that I was all alone in this park at this point. 
I guess something about when the mums were there just comforted me. But now I was alone. Or so I thought at least. I'm nearly finished with mile three when out of the corner of my eye, I see a, a grandpa starting to walk the track coming my way. I'm confused since I believe that he was with the kids earlier, but now all of a sudden the kids were gone. I didn't see another car in the lot besides mine as well. And to make things even more creepy, he was sucking on a lollipop. It was random, but somehow added to the creep factor, I guess, for me at least. My body was telling me to flee, but I'm a stubborn teenager who was determined to run four miles that day. I figured that I would just run past him and be able to move on with my run. I mean, it's not like he would outrun me, right? Anyway, I'm about three steps from him and doing all I can to pretend that I don't see him, acting like I'm super focused and can't be bothered. Just as I thought that I had made it past him successfully, he somehow grabs the wire of my headphones, no earpods since this was back in 2010, and pulls them out of my ears. I turn around at him absolutely livid, but as a woman, I know that I have to play nice to try and lessen my chance of being murdered or something. So I look at him, smile and say, are you okay? He takes a long pause, still sucking on that lollipop, then pulls it out and shows me this really creepy grin that sends shivers down my spine. He looks me up and down and says, like to play alone, huh? While grabbing a piece of my blonde hair that was in a ponytail. I smacked his hand off my hair and sprinted as fast as I think that I ever have back to my car at this point. I had a 1994 Saturn that could only be unlocked manually with a key, so like any horror movie, it takes me a ridiculous amount of attempts to get this key in the hole. All the while, I can hear him walking towards me, slow and steady. Finally, after what seemed like hours but was most likely only a few seconds, I unlocked my car and jumped in. I locked the door and soon after the old man was almost to my car. I start the engine and start to back out of my parking spot. I see the man try to get behind my car, but luckily I was quick enough, so he wasn't able to. I booked it out of the parking lot and I didn't look back. Now, obviously, I don't know what his plans were. I don't know why he was watching those children play, and I don't know how the heck he kept a lollipop in his mouth so long without it melting away like that. I'm just really glad that I didn't stick around to find out what his plans were. Fast forward to now though and I'm 28 years old and have still never returned to that park even though it's the closest park to my house. Hopefully that man is long gone but I for one am not going to go and look and see. My dad lives near a woodland track that's perfect for dog walking and during COVID he got a dog which I've not really had much interaction with due to the nearly two years of restrictions. This dog can become anxious though and worried when she can't find someone that she recognizes. So we decided that the best way to get her comfortable with me would be to take her for a walk along the track. I would let her off the lead and if she wandered too far, call her name to get her back. It was towards the end of this walk that stuff got really creepy very quickly though. You see, it starts getting dark and we're nearing the end of the track and the beginning of the main road back home. I call the dog back to put her lead on, all is fine, until she's back by my side. Because just as I'm leaning down to put her lead back on, I hear a noise in the woods. My dad's dog hears it too and nearly sprints after it. I manage to get her lead on in time though and look towards the noise. And then I hear it again. A voice. A voice calling my dog's name just as I have been all walk. And I don't just mean saying the same name. I mean trying its hardest to copy my voice. I feel like I'm completely frozen in place. I didn't want to turn my head from the woods in case whoever this was came running out at me. I was praying that I was just hearing things, but then, just like the time before, but this time from a spot closer to us, the voice called out for my dog again. It was at this point that I grabbed the dog and I ran. 
I didn't hear the voice again and eventually I got out of this place and I went back home. And while I realized that this was a very brief encounter, it's still one of the most terrifying situations that I've ever found myself in. So I was out one morning, late for school, and decided, hey, I'm already late, what will it hurt to get something to eat? So I stop by a McDonald's and I go in. It's like 7 in the morning and there's nobody in there but this guy and his kid. The man offers to buy me breakfast as it's pouring rain and you look like you could talk to someone. I figure, sure, free meal, why not? So... He orders me food and I sit down at the table with him and his kid. I'm not sure if they were a girl or a boy to be honest, but they were short and had this big hoodie on, messy hair, the works. This guy on the other hand was a solid six foot five, well dressed and super sociable. He sat down and started talking about God and his church and all this other stuff. But the whole time his kid was picking their breakfast burrito apart and staring at me, they had marker all over their fingers like they dipped their hands into ink or something. They looked like the only thing keeping them awake was, I don't know, terror. The guy excused himself to the bathroom at one point and his kid slid a, a piece of paper over to me with what looked like crudely scribbled on with horns labeled neon and effing garbage. That definitely freaked me out and I left after that. I have no clue how old this kid was, but I'd say maybe 12. It wasn't horrifying, but the combo of his hobo demon child glaring at me as they ripped up napkins and scribbled creepy drawings and ate their burrito in a sort of demented manner, contrasted by the dad being overly polite and excessively talking about God and bringing people to the light and salvation and stuff like that, made me super uncomfortable and scared the daylights out of me. I don't know. I think that there was something more going on. In any case, these days, I use the drive through only now. So before I begin this, I would like to say first that I've always believed in the paranormal, even though this was the first time that I'd ever witnessed something supernatural like this. Also, English isn't my first language, so I apologize for anything that sounds a bit weird. So, I, an 18-year-old male, live in northwestern France, Normandy, and it's not a place with endless forests. Uh, in fact, it's pretty flat and boring for the most part. Since I was a kid, I would stay there for two weeks during the spring holidays at my grandparents' house in the Jura region in eastern France. The Jura region is a really hilly place with a lot of forests and amazing wildlife, so it's pretty much the opposite of where I'm from. During my time here, I usually go deep into the woods to pick mushrooms and berries, and I never really saw anything weird. The animals that you see there are like deer, foxes, badgers, wild boars, squirrels, rabbits, and very recently, even some wolves have been back in this area of France. Now, if I remember correctly, it was the 2nd of May 2022 and as I said, I was in the forest near the village of Gyron to pick berries. I was alone there and there was nobody around but it was not something like strange or anything because it's a very sparsely populated part of France. But the thing that did feel strange was the fact that I didn't see any animals, no deer, no wild boars, no foxes. In fact, it was eerily silent. I'm not going to lie, I was starting to get a little bit uncomfortable because the silence was making me a little bit scared, but I decided to keep picking berries because my mum wanted to make some pies and I love her pies. As I was walking in the woods, I could see a, a clearing and I was thinking about taking a break in this place because I've been walking for like almost an hour at this point. That was until... I saw a very big, dark mass that was bipedal and it was standing in the clearing. I stopped walking and 
I was staring at this thing behind the trees for like 20 seconds before I just turned tail and I ran back to the village. Now, to give a bit of a description, it was very tall and hairy, probably maybe seven foot. Perhaps the best way that I can describe it too is that it looked like a, a bipedal wolf or like a half dog, sort of half human. And I don't know if this thing saw me, but ever since then, I've never put a foot back in that forest again. When I got back to my grandparents' house, I gave my mum the berries that I'd picked and I stayed in my room for the rest of the day. I conducted a, a lot of research about the wildlife in this region to see if what I saw was some kind of a, a rare animal or something, but no. What I saw, as far as I can tell, was not an animal at all. While conducting the research, I did stumble across a story from the 16th century, though. It's the story of a werewolf that apparently was destroying children in the village of Jura. It was in a place called Amange, and even though Amange is pretty far from Gairon, it's still in the Jura area, so there is a, a possible connection, I guess. In any case, I was really freaked out by this discovery, but I wanted to know more about werewolves and stories like that in this part of France, so... I watched a two hour long video about two women who were talking about what they saw in the Jura. When I looked at the drawing that one of the women in the video did, my heart stopped because I'm telling you, it looked exactly like what I saw that day. Now, I know that werewolves are a part of the Jura folklore. There's even a celebration that takes place the last weekend of June to celebrate the story of the werewolf of Amange. But since this experience, I just haven't been able to sleep well at my grandparents' house because, I don't know, I always feel like I'm just being watched or something. The view from my window is nothing but a big forest, so it's really not reassuring. But I'm back in Normandy since May of 9th, but I'm thinking about it every day and now I want to go back. I didn't tell anyone about this sighting yet because... I don't want to sound crazy and I don't have any pictures to prove that I'm not lying, but I don't know, maybe I could get something. What do you guys think? Am I crazy? I'm a real estate agent who works and lives in a small town in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountain. I work alongside my husband at his family-owned agency that has been here since the 70s. We rarely sell homes or represent buyers for homes that are more than like an hour outside of our area. But occasionally when I have an appointment with a client close to the highway that takes me one up the mountain, I take the opportunity to drive another 30 minutes towards my favorite scenic mountain overlook. It was a rainy day in May that I needed to assess the progress of a house under construction. This house was only 30 minutes away from this overlook. I decided after assessing that the house had little to no progress since the last time that I drove past it, so I would head towards the overlook. There was nothing unusual about this rainy day until I turned left onto the highway leading me to the overlook. Several yards before coming to a stop sign, I noticed a black bird in the middle of the road that appeared sort of indifferent towards me driving straight for it. The bird's response time was delayed for a clean getaway. I heard its body fly right into the grill of my Ford, crunching its fragile bones and looking in the rearview mirror with a distraught face. I saw that I cleaned its head right off. Now, I'm not a crazily superstitious person, but I do believe in signs, whether positive or negative, that the world provides before events unfold. I told myself, this cannot be good, and after maybe driving 10 or so minutes up the mountain, the light rain turned into a pour, making the road slick, the fog thick, and extremely difficult to drive. At this point, I could feel something telling me to just turn back, I felt as though something was off and justified that it was a, a feeling of guilt for killing that innocent black bird back there. I kept driving. Five minutes passed and I wasn't far away from the overlook. For the last 25 minutes I'd been driving, nobody was behind me until now. A small red Tacoma truck that had a, a Porter John in its bed was tailing my car. 
I figured that I would lose the truck since it would probably continue to the highway as I would turn left towards the overlook. But to my unfortunate surprise, it followed me and proceeded to inch even closer to my vehicle. I was slightly panicking as the rain poured even harder and the fog made it that much more difficult to see the road in front of me. Two minutes away from the overlook, I noticed a white truck with its lights turned on and pulled off the side of the road. The car looked as though it was waiting for someone, but what a peculiar place to wait since, I mean, there's really nothing there. The red truck is still on my tail and just as I was sure that he would run off the mountain... I found the overlook to my left, swerved into its parking lot, and finally let out a, a huge sigh of relief. But it was very short-lived. I looked to my left a few yards away. The small red Tacoma truck was parked as well as at the overlook parking lot. For a few minutes, I sat in my car thinking to myself, maybe he's just taking a lunch break or... Perhaps he just couldn't see anything past the fog and doesn't want to chance driving in these conditions. A few more minutes passed and the individual driving the red truck opened his door to get outside and in his arms he was holding a gun. He was a 5'8", grimy man with black hair, around his mid-40s with a toothpick in his mouth, overalls with a strap hanging off and a shotgun that would make the bravest of men cower. He was making strides towards my car, but I didn't want to wait for him to reach his destination. I trembled with immense fear and immediately started my car and I headed in the direction that I'd come from. The grimy man didn't follow me in a small red truck, but the white truck parked off the side of the road from earlier was on my tail again and driving even more recklessly than the man with the shotgun. The rain was finally starting to lighten up a bit, but... The fog lingered way longer than I wished it did. He drove on my tail for 10 minutes until I finally lost him in the fog and quickly turned right back onto the road. I was relieved that it didn't turn into an impasse on the mountain because, I mean, to be honest, who knows what would have happened if it had been like that. I lived in a 100 to 150 year old house, according to the landlord anyway. But for six months-ish, while my family was renovating our home, it was a very old house with a creepy basement and a hidden second staircase behind the kitchen. There were four bedrooms, two vacant, the one that I slept in and the one my parents slept in. The one my parents slept in had a walk-in closet with a window in it where you could look through and see the top of the stairs. I always thought that it was strange and it'll be an important detail later so keep it in mind. So we moved in when I was around 15 or I had just turned 15 that is. The memories are a little bit foggy but I'll try my best to remember everything. So the first instance of activity that I can remember was the night that I moved in and it was pretty passive as I would call it anyway. I remember sitting up alone in my room after unpacking a couple of boxes and I was listening to a CD on this old stereo that my parents had bought. My parents were downstairs watching TV, I think. And I remember everything just being, well, pretty fine. It was late at night and it was dark. The only light on upstairs being my room. The hall was pitch black and I should add that I had never been scared of the dark except for when I was a young kid. But I remember pausing my music because I could have swore that I heard footsteps and I thought my dad was coming up the stairs to tell me to turn it down. He did that a lot. But I still heard him talking to my mum downstairs. It felt though like someone was standing in the doorway and I remember feeling really unsettled. The feeling didn't leave me too and I sat there for a solid five minutes putting my music back on to try and ease my mind but it still felt distinctly like someone was standing there staring at me in the doorway. I couldn't see anyone obviously but I remember getting so spooked out that I hurried downstairs and I joined my parents in the living room. I said that I felt creeped out and my mum said that it was probably just being in a new place and I'd settle down and get used to it eventually. Bearing in mind that 
This was my first ever experience of the paranormal and I had never felt like this before. I was convinced that somebody was upstairs though, but my parents, they just brushed it off. Now, this sort of thing persisted for a few days, but only when I was somewhere alone. My mum refuses to talk about the house, so I've never found out if either of my parents had the same experiences, but given her defensiveness on it, I presume that she must have. Less passive things, though, started happening after this. At first, I dismissed it. Things like the pool balls on the table being moved when I returned to the games room, even when I knew that I put them there in their little triangle formation for the game. But when I'd come back, they'd be scattered across the table like someone broke them and started the game without me. Small things would go missing too and reappear somewhere else, or move very slightly, but just sort of nuisance things like that. Things one could disregard as just forgetting something. This persisted for a while, and I didn't tell my parents about it because I didn't think anything of it. I remember though when things got more intense. I'd start to get chills right before something would happen in fact. The room would get freezing cold for no explainable reason. The house did have many drafts, but it wasn't enough to make the room from like lukewarm to freezing cold in a few seconds like that. That was something weird. And then something would always happen like an object would fall or I'd hear a noise and the room would go back to being warm again like nothing had changed. The first time that I felt truly scared was when I woke up in the bed in the middle of the night and I felt like something was staring at me. I always slept with my door shut and it felt like a stranger was standing in my room over me watching me sleep. I had a shelf of books and various ornaments above my bed. My bed was against the wall and I remember three of them falling on my legs and feet, one right after the other, and then everything just went completely quiet again. Nothing else happened that night and I fell back asleep, which was difficult, but I would also hear tapping on my door at various points in the night and I was awake for a couple of those occasions too. One night I couldn't sleep and I heard three taps on my door. Admittedly, they were very quiet, like somebody had tapped a single fingernail against the door three times. But there was this one night where this happened multiple times, but the tapping would always come in threes. Then it would be silent for about half an hour and then I would hear it again. In those beginning three weeks, looking back on it, the activity was like your standard haunting, I guess. Just nuisance and creepy things. But... It was about a month into living there that things got super intense for me, and quite honestly, really scary. It was like the intensity scale went from 0 to 100 within a few days. Well, at least that's what it felt like. It was such a drastic change from the odd disturbance to actual violent events that I couldn't explain it. One evening, I was in the house alone, only for about an hour, I was rarely ever in the house alone, to be honest. There was always such a, a foul feeling about it that I avoided it, and I felt unsafe ever being there by myself at this point. My family had to be there, or else I would just go out and, and wait out by the back door until they got home from work in my school uniform. I, I felt entirely on edge the entire time. I couldn't sit still, I, I couldn't focus on homework or the TV, music, nothing. I just kept feeling that same feeling like someone was watching me, but it felt worse somehow because I was alone, I guess. I couldn't run to anyone to feel better. It was just me and whatever this was. I remember I was trying to focus on some movie or on the TV and the room all of a sudden went cold again and I was instantly like, oh no, what do I do? By now, I had figured out that what I was dealing with was some sort of a spirit, and I was very familiar with the concept of ghosts and hauntings, but I didn't believe any of it until I moved into this place. I remember the movie was just ending and the screen went dark on the credits screen, and I could see my own reflection in the TV. And I saw something very distinct rush behind me, past me, and presumably through the door into the kitchen. You had to walk through the living room to get to this kitchen, and it was like a, 
a tall black smoky figure, but it had no distinguishing shape. What I mean is that it had like no humanoid figure. It was almost like just a bundle of half transparent black smoke that just sort of shot past in half a second. Seriously, like one blink and I would have missed it. Now, I'm not going to say that I acted tough in this moment or that I was brave or anything. I literally just burst into tears because I was terrified. And somehow seeing it made all my fears a reality that I couldn't pass off as an excuse anymore. My parents obviously didn't believe a word that I told them, so I just stopped telling them anything and they didn't help, making me think that I was delusional and perhaps even crazy. I saw it again too, a total of four separate occasions. The second being when I was in a walk-in closet in my parents' bedroom looking for something. I can't remember what it was, but I remember peeking out of the weird window that I told you about earlier and seeing a black shadow for a few seconds on the stairs, and it just sort of faded away. The third occasion was a tall black mist standing still in the corner of my room. I woke up and I felt paralyzed. That was my first experience ever of sleep paralysis too, and I remember seeing it in my peripheral vision, standing in the corner of my room until I regained well, consciousness, I guess you could call it, in my body, and when I could move, I turned to face it, and it had just disappeared. This one you might be able to discount as a hallucination. I'm aware of that because I know people experience uh, sleep paralysis and weird things like this, so take that one with a grain of salt, I guess. But the fourth and final time, I saw it fully, and it was in the kitchen. I was writing out a French exam, I'm pretty sure, or something to do with French class, and I turned and saw it rush through the kitchen door into the living room. I don't know why I saw it. I don't know if it was showing itself to me or something. Because I've never seen another spirit since, and I've lived in multiple homes, perhaps even haunted ones. The worst experience, however, was yet to come. There's two that sort of tie hand in hand with the, the worst experiences in this house, which convinced me that this thing did not have good intentions. You see, I felt touches and what felt like light shoves sometimes, especially when I was on the stairs. I'd feel like a, a cold, icy breeze against my shoulder, like something was running their hand really quickly across my skin. The worst day for me, though, was when I was upstairs alone. You see, I went into the third bedroom, it was used as a storage room and that room was always cold, freezing even. Even if you stuck a heater in there, it would just never really seem to warm up. But I remember that I went into the room and started rifling through boxes and I was looking for something. I remember sitting back because I could just smell something rotten. Not like that sickly moldy sweet smell that is like rotten food or fruit. If you've ever smelt a dog food box that's sort of exploded and left to go moldy, then you'll know what the type of smell that I'm talking about is. It was absolutely putrid, and it honestly just came out of nowhere. And I just remember a box at the end of the room shaking, gently sort of back and forth. I looked at it, and it was just a box of books. There wasn't anything significant, just a random storage box trying not to be sick at the same time as watching this, mind you. The smell was making me gag every second, and I was just glued to my spot on the floor watching this box move on its own. And the feeling in that room was so heavy all of a sudden. It was like the air was physically pressing down on my skin and my chest, and it was really hard to breathe all of a sudden. I couldn't think. All I could feel was anger and fear. I don't even know where the anger came from, to be honest. Maybe being angry at this thing for making me feel threatened in my own home? I'm not sure, but that's how I felt at the time, and I remember it. I also remember when the box slid a few centimeters. It didn't slide by much, but after it slid, it was still, and the smell just, all of a sudden, faded away. But that entire day, I felt like something was almost sitting on my shoulders. My entire body felt so heavy and 
I felt really tired and grouchy and I was lashing out at everyone around me in this blind anger that I couldn't explain. I went to bed early because I felt so tired that day and I remember waking up the next morning and I had three lovely bright red scratches across the top of my arm and I knew that I didn't do them. One of the reasons too is because I'm a very bad nail biter. I haven't really got any nails to speak of and definitely did not back then. The entire remainder of the time that I stayed there though and for quite some time after I just couldn't shake this feeling, this heavy feeling that I had. It always felt like I had a chain strapped to my ankle. Every breath, every step felt heavy. I was always so tired and sort of depressed all the time. Ever since that day in the room with the box, it's like, I don't know, everything just changed for me. Everything was flipped upside down and my happiness just tanked. And even six years later, things are just not the same. So, I guess my question for you guys is, does anyone have any idea as to what all this was? And if you do, is there anything that I can do to change this? To go back to a time before any of this happened?